Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Camarillo Airport ALP Update and Narrative Report meeting. Thank you so much for coming out. We appreciate you guys taking the time tonight. We'll let everybody take a seat and get settled. Get this going. Okay, so we're going to get started. It's Six o'clock, we want to be respectful of everybody's time. My name is Stacey Falcioni, and I am a part of the project team here, and I'll be your facilitator tonight. And with me, I have uh, Elsa Argamanes, who's outside at the registration table. And we also have Jeanette Hayragi. I think I said that right. <laughs> and she is somewhere here. Jeanette, if you can wave. There we are. There's Jeanette. And I think most of you know Jeanette from your, from your community. She's your communications and engagement manager. And then in the back, we also have interpreters uh, for the group tonight. We have Mexteco and Spanish. So if you guys can give me a little wave back there, interpreters, Alma. Hi, thanks. So if anybody needs any extra interpretation, please approach the table behind you. All right, we're going to get going here. We're going to talk about tonight's format. Um, so hi. Absolutely. I don't see why not. Yeah, please stand. All right, let's put our right hand over our heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. All right, so let's continue on. We're going to talk about tonight's format. So we're going to hear from your uh, director of airports, Keith Freethis, if I'm saying that right. Um, he will talk about uh, how we got here and where we are uh, basically going. And then we're going to hear from our, um, our technical team, some of the project uh, managers and principals there, uh, one being Patrick Taylor. He's going to talk about the summary of the technical presentation and kind of the, the ALP update. And then we're going to get to frequently asked questions. This is where Jeanette's going to go through some, some hot topics that we have heard from you guys and gals. Uh, so we'll be able to go through those and hopefully answer a lot of your, a lot of your questions that way. And then next, we're going to talk um, a little bit more in depth, and we're going to get into questions from you guys. So everybody should have gotten a question card. So if you have that... This is what we would love for you to do. We would love for you to listen to the presentation, maybe listen to some of the frequently asked questions, and then if you still have questions, if you can write down your question on this card when you're done, raise it up, get somebody's attention. We have a lot of staff here that are going to be circling around. They'll collect that from you, and then they'll bring it up to us, and then we'll have a formal uh, panel uh, question and answer session where, where we will read out your question and then the panel will have the opportunity to answer that question. And then at the very end of the presentation, if you still have outstanding questions, then we will uh, open up uh, the voice question answering session where, where we will be uh, passing around a microphone. And that's kind of what I just went through there. So again, questions please submit on your half sheet. And we also have comment cards. So that's, that's the longer form. If you don't want to ask your question, if you don't feel like standing up, if you don't feel like doing it tonight, you just want to leave a comment and you want the, the project team to answer it later, you can fill out the longer form and it's in the back there and um, leave that for us. All right. <laughs> okay, lastly, really quick, we're going to go over the code of conduct tonight. So the county is committed to ensuring that all participants can fairly and clearly share ideas, comments, and concerns about the project here at Camarillo Airport. To provide a safe and equitable process, please remember, one, to treat each other with kindness and respect, including your neighbors, the moderators, and the panel. Number two, respect the format of the meeting. And lastly, maintain a conversational tone. 
So we appreciate everybody's uh, participation and consideration as we get going. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Keith, who's uh, going to talk a little bit more about the process. Thanks, Keith. Stacy, uh -oh, breaking things already. Thank you. All right. So, uh, first of all, I, the this presentation and the format is feedback. We had we've had two public meetings so far, and this format where we did a presentation, enough seating, uh, even some snacks, um, is kind of a result of the feedback we got from the first two meetings. So, I want to point that out. Let's move on to the the first slide. A little closer in there. All right, how about that? Okay. It's on, and I have the clicker, okay. All right, so uh, for many of you, this is maybe the first meeting that you've attended. So we thought it would be important to kind of go back to the history, uh, where we've been through this process and how we got to this point tonight. So um, back three and a half years ago, uh, the airport, my predecessor, uh, a different airport director, had started a master plan process. That was all the way back in September 2020. So we lined up FAA funding to do this study. We actually had our first uh, meeting uh, in June and immediately got some, some feedback on that. That's not the direction from our community members. And then at the same time, uh, City of Camarillo elected officials decided to do their own survey of what they wanted to see the future of the airport. So at that point, we kind of froze uh, the master plan process, and that's when I came in, uh, in in November of 2021. And so we moved forward from that point um, to having not, no longer a master plan but just doing an ALP, airport layout plan, update. So that's a component of a master plan. Master plan is where you look at all kinds of things. Do you want, and, and that was in there, airline service, air cargo, those, that was all put on hold. We decided we're not doing that. We're leaving it as is, General Aviation Airport, and we're moving to just doing the ALP, airport layout plan portion of that. No changes. And then... I did a presentation, it looks like July of 2022, with the City Council of Camarillo of the things we were going to look to do. Um, we had pivoted from a master plan and ALP. Again, no changes to the Camarillo Airport. We also committed that we were going to apply for and seek a grant to do a noise study, what things we could do to be met better neighbors. And then I added some other things, and you'll see as I go through the presentation, but moving forward, those are the, we've had two meetings uh, for the ALP. We've had two meetings for the noise study. Uh, this is the last meeting for the ALP study. And then we continue uh, on the noise study process that will continue, continue through the rest of this year. So the key components where we are again today is no changes to the use of Camarillo Airport. It will remain a general aviation airport. We've heard questions about large air cargo that is not on the table for Camarillo Airport. We're, we're not looking to change the length of the runway. We're being consistent with the joint powers agreement that was signed between the county and the city in 1976. And the last piece is no scheduled commercial airline service. So many of you are here about noise concerns. So let's talk about what we've done, and we're going to talk in the presentation. Jeanette will finish with some of the things as well, hitting on them again. But what have we done so far? Um, as I would mentioned in uh, my, my meeting, my presentation, more than a year ago with the city of Camarillo, we're looking for the first time to hire communi communications engagement manager. That's Jeanette. You, you heard introduced. She's been with us for about a year and a half, so she's in place. She's already working on the fly friendly. What things can we do now to help address noise issues with our communities? So that's what she's working on, both Oxnard and Camarillo airports. We spent money on a new flight tracking system for both airports so that we could track airplanes, aircraft, where they are, what altitudes, what time they're flying, who it is that's flying, so we can work with them to help mitigate the noise issues. Um, I already talked about we, we 
moved from a master plan to just doing an ALP update. That's what we're in the middle of. We did secure, as I mentioned, uh, the noise study funding from the FA, and we're in the middle of that process right now. And then I'll just end with what happens with me on a regular basis. I meet uh, monthly at a minimum with folks from the city of Camarillo, uh, city manager's office, uh, their elected officials, uh, Mayor Tremblay, and all of the city council members on a regular basis, mostly, many times, talking about noise issues specifically, but also our own elected officials with the county. Uh, Supervisor uh, Kelly Long is here tonight, uh, Supervisor VNA Lopez that has Oxnard Airport in her district, but also um, the county executive officer, Dr. Savet Johnson, all of which support uh, us working short-term, long-term uh, on these noise issues and um, supporting the Joint Powers Agreement as it was signed back in 1976. So up here, um, and it's important, uh, again, I think many of you here are concerned about noise. You should be involved, and again, there'll be many times that we'll talk about this through the presentation, in our noise study, which is a separate process. Uh, we're in, so if you aren't already involved, go to our website or leave your contact information, you can get on that. But as you see up above, we're wrapping up the airport layout plan, plan process, and we've, we've got the rest of this year to continue through our Part 150 noise study. Our next targeted um, public meeting is May of this year. So if you don't leave here with anything, these are the three things I want you to leave tonight here is. You are being heard. Again, I, I talked about what we've been doing over the last two years. When I was hired, this issue was at the top of the list of things I should focus on as the new director of airports. Noise, rebuilding relationships with the community, uh, rebuilding relationships with the city of Camarillo, specifically we're on that list. We have a roadmap for moving forward. That is um, the noise study we talked about. And again, it's a separate process, but um, that's where we formulate the things we will do short-term and long-term uh, to help resolve and adjust and mitigate, whatever you want to call it, the noise issues and concerns that we have. And last is our efforts won't stop. Again, when we come up with the final noise program, that's what we submit through our elected officials that get support and buy-in. So if someday I get run over by an airplane, it continues on. There is a process, and everybody's bought into what we're going to do long-term in this process. So those are the three things I hope you leave tonight with. And I'll kick it, I think, to maybe our next speaker, Patrick. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm Patrick Taylor. Uh, I'm a principal with Kaufman Associates. Uh, we are a national uh, aviation planning firm, uh, and that's all we do is we do planning work for airports across the country. Uh, we don't do the engineering or any of the construction man management. Anything that might come down the line, uh, we're not responsible for. We just put together the plan that meets FAA guidelines and FAA standards. And I've got uh, two other uh, of my colleagues down here. Matt Quick is also a principal. He is the uh, principal in charge. And Corey Lewis is our principal uh, in charge of the Part 150 noise study that is going on concurrently, uh, as Keith said. So what I'm going to be covering is really just a kind of an overview of the technical sides of the airport layout plan and narrative report. So that is the study that we're focused on tonight. Of course, with the understanding that there's a lot of folks who may be interested in kind of the noise side of things, so we have experts here, of course, to answer those questions as well. But I'm gonna be focusing on the uh, ALP update study that we're uh, currently doing right now. So uh, I'll use that term ALP, it's an ALP update. Uh, that is the airport layout plan, which is, uh, it is uh, a document uh, that the airport is required to have and that the FAA uh, approves and it gives the airport the ability to be eligible uh, for FAA funding for various infrastructure projects, capital projects, primarily pavement-related projects. So the airport has to have that on file and approved by the FAA uh, in order to seek any potential grants to, to maintain the pavements at the airport. 
Uh, the planning period for an ALP update is about 10 years. Uh, that's different than a master plan, uh, which this originally started as uh, three or four years ago, which is a 20-year look at the airport. So this is much narrower, uh, and it's also focused on maintaining uh, the vital infrastructure at the airport. Um, I'll move on to the next one. So the ALP update will focus on prioritizing potential projects, and I say potential uh, on purpose because one of the things that will come out of this study is a list of projects that we think the airport may need in the future, all of which are eligible for FAA funding, but there's no guarantee, not from the FAA, not from the airport, not simply because of the approval of the ALP that any of those projects will happen or will be funded. What we're identifying is that there's a potential need, uh, and some of that need is based on the forecasts, which I'll talk about, and some of that need is based just on changing FAA design standards, which you'd be surprised change frequently. Uh, there's almost something changing in terms of improvements to safety at airports and airfields every year that we have to learn about, be experts about, and apply to studies like this. Um, I, I can't uh, underemphasize or overemphasize uh, how important it is to maintain the pavements at, at an airport. And the FAA knows that. The federal government knows that. And so they provide funding for that. It's different than a highway where maybe some potholes can linger for a while. You can't have potholes on a runway because that leads to immediate disaster. So it's important uh, for airports in good stead to maintain their pavements in a safe and usable condition. Uh, this is a, a graph, a schedule timeline of this project uh, as it is to date. And one thing I might notice I, I, or mention, I saw a few folks kind of taking pictures. This whole PowerPoint will be on the county's airport's website. I think we'll probably be able to have it up by Thursday or Friday. So if you want to save some, some memory on your phone, you can just wait for that to, to be up as well. Um, but the project, uh, the ALP update, is fairly scripted. Uh, there's FAA guidance that, that kind of tells us what we need to look at and what we need to study, and that starts with an inventory chapter, so an establishment of the baseline condition of the airport, followed by forecasts uh, of aviation demand, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but that's basically how many planes live at the airport, how many operations there are, takeoffs and landings. And then it goes into a facility requirements element. So what do you need going forward based on those forecasts? Uh, and then into kind of a recommended plan and a capital improvement pro program. Um, follow, you know, we're pretty close to the end. This is our, our third of three scheduled uh, meetings. Uh, and so we're looking to get as much possible feedback as we can, make any final adjustments that we might need to to the plan uh, and then move forward with the uh, with finishing up the the document. Okay, so I'm going to go through a little bit of each of the elements of the study so far. So I mentioned the inventory, which is kind of that baseline condition. Uh, and from this perspective, I'm sure this aerial of the airport looks really busy. And so I'm not trying to impart all the things that are happening at the airport or all of the infrastructure that's out there. But you should be able to get an understanding just from how busy this graph is, is that there's a lot of things going on out there. You know, we've got our runways and our taxiways and our aprons, but there's a lot of hangars for airplanes, and there's a lot of other businesses uh, that benefit and are based out uh, at the airport. One thing I always like to kind of touch on, folks may not really have an understanding of the economic impact of an airport. And... Uh, Camarillo did an economic uh, impact as assessment just a few years ago, back in 2019. So just to summarize, uh, that study found that the airport itself was responsible for 1,764 jobs, about $115 million in payroll, and over $230 million in total economic output. So it's actually a, a revenue generator for the region. And then on the other side of the equation, it also generates tax revenue which goes to all sorts of services, of course, uh, in, in the county and the city. And that totaled almost $35 million in, in tax uh, input. So, uh, so this is uh, a bit of a summary of the national airspace system. So most folks don't really realize that there's almost 20,000 airports in the country. Uh, the FAA recognizes that about 3,000 of those, in fact, uh, 3,287, 
they identify as critical to the national airspace system, and Camarillo is one of those airports. About 383 are commercial service airports, so your LAX and Burbank, those folks. But the remaining 2,904 are general aviation airports, like Camarillo. Those airports are also uh, classified in different levels in national, regional, uh, local, and basic. And Camarillo is one of only 107 out of those nearly 3,000 classified as a national general aviation airport. So it's it's pretty uh, important facility uh, from the FAA's perspective uh, in terms of the entire system. So I'll move into the forecasting element. <clears throat> this is a required element. It's one of two elements that the FAA uh, specifically approves, reviews and approves. Uh, the forecasts, and the other element is the technical drawings uh, that come at the end. That is also called the airport layout plan. Uh, so on the forecasting side, um, there's three elements for a general aviation airport. Um, base aircraft is the first one. So this is kind of the most basic uh, indicator of demand at the airport. There's about 350 based aircraft today. There is a forecast for additional based aircraft in the future. Uh, and so what th that translates into is there's a potential need for additional hangar space to house those, uh, those based aircraft that would come from an unconstrained forecast. Now, of course, if there's no hangars, then there's no room for any new based aircraft. But that doesn't mean the demand doesn't exist. It does exist. Um, on the operations side, so that's a takeoff is one operation, a landing is one operation. Uh, and the number of operations uh, helps us in determining the airfield capacity and some other needs, uh, including environmental uh, needs like noise uh, analysis, apron space, things along those lines. And then the third element in the forecasting is the critical aircraft. So this is an FAA design standard. It is that plane or family of plane of aircraft with similar characteristics that account for 500 annual operations. And so that critical aircraft determination relates to primarily the runway taxiway uh, system as well as the separation standards. Uh, so when you look at a runway, you might see a piece of pavement out there, but really that runway also includes safety areas to the side, object-free areas uh, to the side, and beyond the runway ends. So there's a lot of stuff out there that you might not see, uh, but that is protecting the safety of the, of the environment. Uh, these numbers are a little bit hard to see, but all of this material is available on the website as well, uh, so you guys can go get the exact same thing that we've put together. But it's a summary of the forecast. Um, again, the ALP update is a 10-year forecast. We're required by the FAA to do a full 20-year forecast, but, we, but the entire study is uh, focused on those uh, first 10 years. Uh, and just basically the summary is... Uh, the based aircraft is about 350 right now, expected to go to about 390 within the next 10 years. And again, that's an unconstrained environment. If there's room out there for, for them to come, we would anticipate that they may come. And then operations are about 187,000 last year, uh, and going up to, well, in 20 years, 216,000 and about 200,000 within the 10-year time frame. And then the critical aircraft, so this is that aircraft or family of aircraft that accounts for 500 annual operations is uh, a plane like that. It's a, a business jet. In this case, it's a Gulfstream 650. They do more than 500 operations a, a year. The forecasts show that that critical aircraft will not change. It will remain the same uh, in that class of planes, which is those business jets. Uh, one question that we got was how do these forecasts compare to other forecasts that have been done by the airport? And so this is a graph that shows that. Uh, the black line is the annual operations line, so history going back to 1998. The yellow line, so the first one uh, on the left there, is from the 1998 uh, Part 150 noise study that was done back then. And so you can see that was uh, a lot more aggressive uh, at that time and didn't come to fruition. Uh, the operations stayed pretty moderate uh, compared to that forecast. Uh, then another forecast was done for the master plan. That's the orange line. And then, of course, uh, the forecast for this one in terms of operations is the red line. Uh, so you can see as you get more information, you get more history to base a forecast on. Uh, 
they get a little more moderated uh, just because that's what the history has been showing us. So I know you can't read this, but this is the official uh, FAA uh, forecast approval letter. Uh, and basically what it says is that the forecasts that were put together were done with appropriate methodologies and are reasonable. One thing, uh, the FAA won't approve these forecasts if you put together something that is unreasonable or aspirational or unrealistic. Uh, so they, they really do look at these um, to be something reasonable for planning purposes and planning for the future. I might point out on this side, on this slide, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the last paragraph of that forecast approval letter uh, also comes with a disclaimer. In fact, the FAA likes to use a lot of disclaimers. Uh, in this one, uh, approval of a forecast does not guarantee future funding, and I really can't uh, emphasize that. Our plan shows what we think the airport would need based on the forecast over time, but there's no guarantee that they can do any of those projects um, without FAA funding. And they work, uh, the airports work with FAA every year to update a list of projects for which they might be eligible from the FAA. Uh, and so these things will move around over time and different priorities will rise and fall but we think we have a pretty comprehensive list for the airport to work with for, for at least the next 10 years. And then the bottom one is the disclaimer that is actually on those technical drawings, the airport layout plan itself. Uh, and that basically says the exact same thing, that the FAA, by approving uh, this ALP update or the forecast or the ALP, uh, makes no guarantee uh, on future funding. So basically every single project uh, as it comes down the line has to be justified and reviewed uh, by the FAA at the time of implementation. Um, just a quick summary here. So we've talked about the forecasts a little bit. Uh, a portion of those forecasts, the numbers are translated into activity level needs. Uh, so it anticipates uh, the need for new hangars. So if you could meet the unconstrained forecast growth in based aircraft, you'd need hangars to do that. So part of our responsibility is to identify uh, reasonable places on the airfield where those could be located. Um, sometimes you may or will also need additional uh, ramp space, so place where uh, airplanes park on the outside. Also in the facility requirements is meeting those compliance issues. And like I said, the design standards around airfields change uh, from the FAA. And so there are several uh, non-complying uh, geometries out there, the taxiways, uh, that met standard when they were built, you know, many years ago, but don't today. And so we have identified uh, in the plan projects to rebuild those to standard. Um, and then maintaining existing pavement. So there's an upcoming project in the next few years to reconstruct the runway uh, completely. Uh, in fact, the dimensions of the runway are planned to be changed a little bit, narrowed from 150 feet to 100, which is the new standard. Uh, and to shorten it, it's 6,013 feet long now, uh, and it'll be 6,000 feet at the end of that project. So, and also, just to main, there's a, a requirement to main, have a program to maintain all the other airfield pavements, but of course, those are the, the primary ones, the runways and the taxiways. So let's talk a little bit about what the plan is. Um, so on this exhibit, the things that should ho hopefully pop out is the red areas. That r the red stuff is new pavement. Um, so this exhibit in particular is showing the changes to the future changes at some point to the taxiways. Uh, right now, there's a number of curved taxiways leading to the runway, and that's a non-standard condition for a GA airport now. The standard is to have 90-degree uh, taxiways leading to the runway. So that's part of the plan. Well, when those need to be reconstructed, they'll be reconstructed at standard. Just a little focus in on kind of the northeast area. This is up by the Cloud Nine hangars, the newer hangars. Um, there, as more hangars are going in there, there's likely to be more planes use, utilizing that portion of the airfield. So one of the projects that we've identified is this red taxi lane right in the center of this picture. It's a second taxi lane, so it would create a dual parallel taxi lane situation. So we don't have head-to-head -head concerns from airplanes that are taxiing to and from the runway. This also shows in yellow um, potential future hangars. So these are uh, T hangars, which are a small uh, 
type of hanger that are often connected as they're shown in this picture, um, where it basically can fit a small single engine piston plane um, that you might be familiar with. So that, that's kind of the idea for that particular space is to expand upon the existing T hangers that the county owns there with additional T hangers to accommodate uh, some of the owners of, of small uh, aircraft. So this is kind of a consolidated view uh, of both of those graphics I just showed you, and it has some other information on it. So the other information is uh, a bit of a land use plan on the airport. And basically everything that ha needs access, every parcel that needs access to the runway taxiway system is reserved for future aeronautical activity. It could be a hangar, uh, it could be a ramp, it could be an apron, uh, something along those lines. Uh, the green shaded areas are places that are, or parcels that are outside of the airport fence line, but still on airport property. So the airport has an opportunity to uh, lease those for non-aeronautical purposes, uh, of which there's a number of businesses there already, and then the airport benefits from that revenue and can put that towards other capital projects. So this is that, uh, a list of that capital improvement program I was talking about. Uh, and it's, we've got two colors on here for, uh, for a reason. The pink colors are uh, basically the first 10 years, but we were required to do a 20-year forecast. And we also couldn't identify an opportunity to basically touch every piece of pavement out there uh, that may need it. Uh, so we have added the blue projects. Those are beyond the 10 years, but it, is, it does help the airport as a guide uh, to future planning. So for example, there could be a scenario where the airport would like to do project A that's in the pink, uh, but there's not funding available. Maybe there's funding available for a project that's in the blue, and they can raise that up in the years to come uh, when they're working with the FAA on their capital improvement program. So all of these projects are pavement related. They're all maintenance related. Some of them are complete reconstructions of uh, certain sections. Some of them are more simple uh, milling and overlaying, just resurfacing, but all of it are maintenance projects. And that's essentially what an ALP update is, is it's a, a maintenance program for the airport for the next 10 years. This kind of zooms in a little bit, um, again, each one of those lines describes a pavement maintenance project. We have estimated the cost of those. Uh, and a, an important thing to understand is, uh, of course, a portion of those, about 90%, is eligible for FAA funding. The state also, Caltrans, also uh, participates uh, to, to a certain extent in capital projects. And then the remaining amount is the responsibility of the, of the airport sponsor. But just in the 10-year program, almost $90 million worth of projects have been identified, and a, a huge portion of those is this big reconstruction project of the runway, uh, which is coming up in the next few years. Okay, that is just a summary of the, uh, of the plan itself, and now I'm going to pass it over to Jeanette. Good evening to you all. My name is Jeanette Haregi. I'm the Communications and Engagement Manager and Public Information Officer for the Ventura County Department of Airports. See a lot of familiar faces this evening and a lot of new to me faces this evening. So we're just glad that you're all able to join us tonight. We know the last meeting didn't meet the expectations many of you had and we recognize the importance of providing the opportunity to have your questions and the responses to those questions heard by all in attendance. As you know, tonight you will have that opportunity. And I'd like to add that if you can't hear me, um, or if you can't hear any of our speakers, or um, when questions are asked, if, you, if you're having a hard time hearing, I, I'd like to ask that someone put their, you put your thumb up so we know to turn the volume of our voice up because we wanna make sure that everybody is um, getting the information that's being shared tonight and that everybody is being heard. I'd like to provide a quick reminder to prepare and submit your questions on the blue tabbed question cards, or you may also, as Stacy mentioned earlier, submit a comment card. We continue to have members of our team um, throughout the room who are available to get those, those question and comment cards from you. This next section of the evening 
will include a rundown of the most frequently asked questions we receive and responses to those questions. Please hold any follow-up questions at this time. If you have any follow-up questions, please be sure to make note of the slide number and plan to submit or ask your question during the Q&A, which will immediately follow, this, uh, follow my presentation. All questions that are part of the Q&A uh, portion of the evening will be read aloud and answered by our panel. So let's go ahead and get started. Can the Department of Airports just say no to more aircraft activity and or jet activity? The short answer is no, with several reasons why. When the County of Ventura took ownership of Camarillo Airport, formerly the Oxnard Air Force Base, from the United States government, it did so with the agreement that it would operate as a general aviation airport that provides equal access to all United States citizens. It's important to note that airspace, regardless of obligations or agreements from the county, is federally regulated. Federal grant assurances and the Aircraft Noise and Capacity Act, ANCA, of 1990 place significant limitations to changes the county can make to airport operations. So what are we doing to address noise concerns? Through the Part 150 study, we'll be examining alternatives that we hope will reduce the unwanted effects of existing and projected aircraft activity. Those include the Department of Airports uh, actively working on incorporating jet activity into the Fly Friendly VC program with ongoing discussions with flight operators, working with flight operators to voluntarily minimize flight activity between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., Exploring and analyzing the feasibility of any changes to flight paths, including approach paths. And again, this is all part of the ongoing Part 150 noise compatibility studies, with our next Part 150 community meetings being tentatively scheduled for May 2024. Is the Camarillo Airport going to add scheduled airline service, large air cargo, or lengthen the runway? No. Ventura County Airports continues to support the guidelines outlined in the Joint Powers Agreement. No scheduled airline service, no large air cargo operations, and no lengthening of the runway. What is the Joint Powers Agreement, or JPA, and how does it help us? The 1976 Joint Powers Agreement operating Joint Powers Operating Agreement between Ventura County and the City of Camarillo established the following. Camarillo Airport is to serve general aviation activity. The airport is open 24 hours for landings. Departures are restricted to emergencies between 12 a.m. and 5 a.m. The runway shall not exceed 6,000 feet in length. Aircraft weight is restricted to 115,000 pounds twin wheel. Does the Airport Joint Powers Agreement ban all nighttime aircraft operations? No. The Joint Powers Agreement landing permits landings on a 24-hour basis, but takeoffs are not permitted between midnight and 5 a.m., except for emergencies, including the sheriff, air ambulance, and those sorts of um, activities. The graphic below is an ex excerpt from the JPA. Can the JPA be changed or modified? Pre-existing restrictions and curfews, like the JPA, JPA um, in place before November 5, 1990, are grandfathered in. New restrictions or modification of existing restrictions require following the procedures in the Airport Noise and Capacity Act of 1990 found in Federal Aviation Regulations Part 161. How do the City of Camarillo, Camarillo Airport Authority, County Department of Airports, and Federal Aviation Administration interact or interrelate? City of Camarillo provides input on airport issues through the JPA that established the Camarillo Airport Authority. 
The Camrio Airport Authority bylaws require two members of the Camrio City Council and is advisory to the County Board of Supervisors. County Board of Supervisors provide direction for the Camrio Airport. The county must meet FAA federal obliga obligations associated with the airport deed transfer and grants. What are the daily operations numbers? The table below shows the average daily annual operations historically and as forecast in this study. And this is uh, by the uh, top primary uh, aircraft type. Pistons, helicopters, turboprop, and jets. Camrio Airport operations continue to be predominantly piston aircraft. This graph shows actual aircraft operations by aircraft type from 1998 through 2022, next to forecasted operations for the next 10 years and 20 years. And I'm just holding these up just for a minute for you to be able to take a look. We wanted to again share this graphic to showcase the significant difference in actual operations versus forecast operations for the 1999 Part 150 study. Operations were actually lower 22 years later. What types of airplanes generated the most complaints in 2023? Out of 2,218 complaints received in 2023, people who, people who identified aircraft indicated jets most often with 1,445 comments, or 65% of comments received. The second highest aircraft type identified were turboprops, accounting for 78 total comments, or 3.5%. Another 523 comments did not provide information or specify an aircraft type. What has been the change in jet and turboprop operations over the past 10 years? Since 2014, the average number of jets arriving on an average day has fluctuated. Nationwide upward trends in business jet use during and after the pandemic are also reflected at Camrio Airport. The average daily jet and turboprop arrivals increased from 11 to 16 arrivals on an average day. Average total operations for the airport have increased from 396 to 467 daily takeoffs and landings during the same period. After the AOP update is complete, what is the airport planning to do? The Department of Airports will maintain a safe and efficient system of airports by continuing to pursue FAA grants for capital projects. There will be ongoing pavement, maintenance, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. There will be a focus on preserving the assumptions from the 2011 master plan that still meet FAA standards. We will meet the needs of new and existing business partners within the confines of the JPA. What kind of projects are eligible for FAA grant funding? Generally, only non-revenue projects are eligible for FAA grant funding. This includes pub public pavement construction, rehabilitation, and maintenance. Does the ALP update show all the projects that may occur at the airport? No, the ALP update only includes those projects that are eligible for FAA grant funding, which is the FAA limitation for this type of study. Other projects funded by the private sector can occur on land leased from the airport. As a public use FAA supported facility, the airport must allow land to be leased for appropriate development on a fair and equitable basis.
Is this ALP update an associated forecast, a marketing plan? No, the ALP update is a data-driven process. It is a planning study designed to outline potential capital needs over the next five to 10 years. Key takeaways. The Department of Airports affirms that the ALP update project is being undertaken to meet FAA requirements and to be eligible for FAA grant assistance. The plan also affirms that the Joint Powers Agreement will remain unchanged. There will be no change in the role of the airport. There's no plan for commercial airline service, no plan for large air cargo operations, no plan to inc increase the runway length. Yes, we are listening to the city and our neighbors regarding noise concerns. And yes, we are taking, um, we are taking action to address those noise concerns. And I'd like to now pass it over to, back over to Stacy, who will be leading the Q&A portion of the evening. Thank you, Thank you Jeanette. Okay, so now we are at the Q&A section. So again, um, if you have any questions that you haven't written down, do that and raise your hand and our staff can come pick that up. Um, and then at the very end, if we um, haven't gotten to your question and if you have another one, we will give you the opportunity to ask that uh, through the microphone. All right, let's get started. Okay, so your panel here, you have met Keith, of course, the director of airports. Uh, next, we have Aaron Powers, who is your airport project manager. Next to Aaron is Dave, who is, um, of course, I'm sure most of you know him as well, deputy director of airports. And then we have the Kaufman and Associates consulting team, uh, Patrick Taylor, Matt Quick, and Corey Lewis. So they'll be here to answer these questions. So here we go. And some of these may have already been addressed, but again, you guys have submitted them, so we are going to go through them. All right, for the panel, why, why is the Camarillo Airport um, allowed to violate the, no, the noise restrictions? How can we limit the number of corporate jets and small planes that use the airport in the future? So I'll pass that over to the airport staff, and if you guys want to start, then you can kind of piggyback off each other. All right. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, the, the, I'll just tell you, the goal is not to deviate from the Joint Powers Agreement, and we don't believe that we do. So I don't know if there's a specific question on that. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we are not allowed to limit the number of operations. We can't preclude those. So that's what we have to allow happen. We believe we're operating within the Joint Powers Agreement. Thank you, Keith. OK, next question. Why do you keep showing up to discuss those that benefit from the goals you share and do nothing to support residents? Why try to BS the community with meetings when nothing is being done about noise? So we'll let maybe Corey, do you want to take that first and then we can continue on? So to the, to the second half of the question, we, as, as Jeanette mentioned, um, our next noise specific meetings are tentatively scheduled for May of 2024. And the format of those meetings will be a listening session where, we'll, where we will hear suggestions on how to uh, reduce noise uh, effects uh, within the community. And so that will lead into preparation of our noise abatement alternatives chapters and land use alternatives chapters uh, that are part of the Part 150 process. Okay, thank you, Corey. Next question. You want to continue? Well, I, I guess I would take, hey, everybody. Hope, uh, hope everybody's got a comfortable seat. Um, so I guess I'd take a swing at the uh, why do you keep having meetings and BSing everybody? And, and it feels like maybe we're just very 
focused on the users and making sure that they're well taken care of and ignoring uh, the residents of of the of the community that the airport exists in. And first of all, I'd say I I, I feel badly that 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 people are affected by airport uh, operations and noise. Um, we are listening. We we heard the. Uh, the affirmative statements about what we are doing. We are actively engaged in listening and taking appropriate mitigating action um, to to reduce the impact of those who are in the way uh, of, of the airport. So uh, we listen to you. We're, there's a number of different things that we are doing. We're doing a, a, a separate Part 150 noise study. Um, but we also shared with you, and this is this is just true, um, that that uh, there are certain things that a public uh, airport can can do, and certain things that we can't do. We can't restrict based on noise, um, but we can do uh, things like working with the community, working with the pilot community, on um, on flying friendly, on on doing things on a voluntary basis, voluntarily curtailing the hours that they fly, on uh, doing things like planning missions outside of, of times when it might affect our neighbors. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're working on separately, not in this particular study, but in the Part 150 study, which is currently ongoing as, as well. Um, so we're committed to all of those, those, uh, those items. Um, to, the, to the extent that we can uh, unilaterally end flying by any particular operator or type of airplane, uh, other than those that don't fit within the Joint Powers Agreement, the JPA, so it's going to be under 115,000 uh, pounds, etc., um, then, you know, that we're doing what we can on a voluntary basis uh, to work with, with those communities to reduce the impacts that normal aircraft operations have uh, on the communities. So that's what we're committed to doing, and, uh, and we do have some other planning things that we, that we do at the same time. Um, but it's not because we're not interested in hearing you and meeting the needs of, of the community. Very good, thank you, Dave. So we're, we're gonna go through the, these questions. There's so many questions, so we wanna make sure that we have plenty of time for all of these. And then at the very end, if you do have a follow-up comment to anything that's being said, we are gonna offer you the microphone. Thank you. Stacey, I would like to add one other thing. Sure, the, go ahead, Corey. The, the, as part of the Part 150 process, FAA requires public involvement. So there, there is a requirement on the, the county side to hold, uh, hold meetings to receive public input on the elements of the Part 150 study. So throughout this process, we have um, at least four meetings um, in the Part 150 study uh, for the Part 150 study. So there's, we've already had two of those meetings. Uh, as I mentioned, we have another one. Um, coming up in May, and then there would be two more meetings um, later in the study process. Okay, great. Let's move on. So this uh, kind of piggybacks off what we all just talked about here. So comment and question. You, you have spent wasted time of all that showed up here tonight to talk about the airport needs, but not homeowner community needs. Uh, most of noise... Uh, are personal aircrafts with no general or national importance. Again, who benefits from the noise and pollution? I'll take a, I'll take a shot at that. Again, I think we've laid out the things we've done to date on noise. That's just starting the process. The Part 150 noise study that we're going to end with will be the end of identifying the things we're going to do. So to say we haven't done anything, then you missed the first part of my presentation. And again, I understand that folks that are concerned about noise, they want the issue resolved right now. The complexities we've described, this is an airport that's been here for more than 80 years. We're dealing with federal obligations, airspace that's controlled by the federal government, and we're trying to maneuver in that to make these changes which just simply don't happen overnight. We also want to be thoughtful as we go through the process. We know um, one of the biggest issues, you saw the, the noise complaints, the greatest number we have are from the Old Town area for approaches on jets. The complexity, we know we're going to do an approach analysis. We're going to spend our own money 
spend our own time to, to do that analysis. Then we've got to submit it to the FAA saying we believe this will help us and then get their approval. These things take time. I appreciate that most of you want those noise issues resolved right away, but it takes time. We also don't want to do something that's going to cause a noise issue in another part of the community. We also got to be concerned with other flight approaches like in to Point Magoo Naval Air Station. You know, they kind of cross paths. So all those things go into this, ana in this analysis that we're going to do, but it will take us some time. Thank you, Keith. Okay, some, some additional noise questions. We have lots of those. Um, if the ALP update is to identify strategies to sustain the airport, why is the airport planning on building out beyond that at the cost of the health of the residents? Any comments there? Could you read the question one more time? Sure, yeah, it's maybe more of a comment. If the ALP update is to identify strategies to sustain the airport, why is the airport planning on building out beyond that at the cost of the health of the residents? I think I would answer it this way, is that there isn't this, the ALP is not designed to develop strategies to sustain the airport. It is a tool that the FAA uses on all airports of what the demand or the needs will be in the future. So again, it's looking into the future what our needs will be for Camarillo Airport. It does it for all the airports in the national system so that they can plan and expect what all of the airports will need over the next five or 10 years. So it, that's how I'd answer. I, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I might add to that too just you know, in looking at the capital improvement program that Patrick talked about, the majority of projects were pavement related. So we have an understanding that over time, the runway system, the taxiway network um, is going, going to need rehabilitation and reconstruction. So knowing that this ALP update is a 10-year plan, we did look at projects that could possibly occur beyond that 10-year plan just because we know pavements fail over time. So again, just trying to come up with a list of projects that the airport can use to coordinate on an annual basis with the Federal Aviation Administration to make sure that they're operating the airport in a safe and efficient manner. Great, thank you, Matt. Why won't the airport department conduct full health studies, noise and pollution prior to the creation of the ALP? True impacts to the community are needed for accurate planning. Reminder, Old Town was there first. So I'll read that again. Why won't the airport department conduct full health studies, noise and pollution, prior to the creation of the ALP? True, true impacts to the community are needed for accurate planning. Reminder, Old Town was, was there first. So, uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? There we go. Uh, so the ALP is not a project, and so it is a it is a plan. Thank you. Maybe I'll just. Okay, there we go. Uh, the AL the airport layout plan update is not a project. It a, is a potential list of projects based on our uh, on our potential needs. And so what will happen is that as projects move forward, as the airport selects projects to move forward, it will have to meet envir environmental requirements, both federally and locally. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, next question. Do you expect regional airport closures that would push traffic, traffic to Camarillo? Is the city of Thousand Oaks included in the planning process? Yeah. Um, as far well, as uh, oh. well, as far as regional closures of airports, the only airport I know in the area that's being discussed about being closed is Santa Monica. Um, pretty much all the airports in the area are included in what's Patrick referred to as the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems. So the FAA sees those airports as important to the air transportation network. And um, I'm not aware of any other closures locally that could impact any 
aviation activity in the area. Okay, great, thank you. What percentage of the 2,218 noise complaints generated in 2023 came from the same primary sources, individuals? I'll read that again. No, we don't know. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't think you need to, to, to read it again. I, we don't have that specific data breakdown. So more of a comment. Okay, next question. How did Camarillo get to be on the airport FAA airport list? If the FAA doesn't provide funding, is there an alternative funding source? Will there be any quiet hours, no fly times? Okay, how did it get on the list? Um, well, it came. The, the airport came to the county as a civilian airport in 1976, and at that time, it was brought into the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems, a, a, a big, a big, funny sounding list that just includes all of the airports that are eligible for funding support from the Aviation Trust Fund. Uh, and that's a, that's a fund made up of uh, ticket taxes collected at, at any airport, um, fuel, uh, anytime aviation fuel is pumped, a little bit of that money goes into the Aviation Trust Fund and Congress uh, authorizes the allocation of that to airports and it's airports within that list who, who are eligible to receive uh, financial assistance for the very costly projects that, that need to uh, happen at airports to sustain the entire aviation system. So we're a, we're a piece of that. Um, but the answer is that it came to us in 1976 when the airport was uh, deeded over to the county of Ventura uh, at that time. Great. Thanks, Dave. And the last part of that was, will there be any quiet hours uh, and no fly times? So I, th I think that was uh, answered in, in the Vance pre-Q&A is we are looking, uh, working with tenants right now. Uh, the 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. is what we're looking for them to voluntarily keep from flying when able. Uh, as mentioned we can't just make a noise restriction, um, as, as discussed. ANCA, 1990, federal government enacted rules that don't allow us just to do that. All right, thank you, Keith. Is Camarillo Airport coordinating noise levels with the military flight paths and their noise levels as you move forward? No. Thank you. Uh, let, let me just add to that. We are building relationships with Point Magoo and Naval Air Station um, Jeanette on a regular basis through their PIO. will let us know if there's something happened. We just had a temporary flight restriction. President is flying in, in the LA Basin, shutting down some of that airspace, which might mean more operations for us. Same with Port, Point Magoo. When they've got some increased operations through our communication opportunities, we send that information out. Jeanette does to keep folks informed of maybe changes in, in what's happening in their area. Okay, next question. Plenty of empty hangars in Central Tees. Why not fix? What is the plan for these hangars? So, uh, here. We do at Camarillo Airport have some county-owned empty tea hangers. Uh, we have a lot of uh, aging infrastructure, and so what we're seeing is that we have hangers that uh, may need more than just small repairs in order to uh, be a functional structure. And we are we we have been for the last year or more working with our county building and safety to understand uh, requirements for permitting uh, that are applicable to our tenants, but also to the county airport stock uh, to be able to maintain those hangars. So uh, that is something that's actively uh, in progress to try to return or to come up with an alternate plan. 
Thanks, Aaron. Can planes be required to approach the airports from the south over the fields? If not, why? Can planes come in from a higher altitude before landing? If not, why? Well, I'll answer simply is those are the kinds of things we will do analysis on during our noise study in Part 150. Those are valid questions, and those are things for sure we will look at. Today's new technology, um, GPS approaches with airplanes, they can do amazing things, turning landings, those kinds of things, and all of that will be looked at. Can we fly more approaches, landings, departures over the ag non-residential area? No question that's a top priority. Is the update to the parallel taxiway and other hard scapes to enable higher frequency of operations? No, the, this is really a maintenance. Um, most of our pavements have been there for 20, 30 plus years. And, in, and with aging infrastructure, you need to be able to take care of it. So that's really what this plan um, identifies, are pavements that are, uh, through our pavement management system uh, plans, have been identified for reconstruction or rehabilitation or repair. Uh, the new parallel taxi lane is just a safety enhancement to support the traffic that will be um, and does travel uh, back and forth between the northeast end of the, of the airport and uh, the runway environment, runway and taxiway environment. Thank you, Erin. How does this airport expansion specifically benefit the citizens of Camarillo? What is needed to get this on the ballot for Camarillo to decide? This is not an airport expansion. Again, this is to meet the needs of what we have. But specifically, again, it's the laundry list so that the FAA can plan and know what they're gonna, we're gonna, they're gonna expect from us in the future to maintain what we have. Okay. Is the airport making money off of this? How much income will be generated if the plan is put in place? How much of this is for Amazon? Amazon is not coming to Camarillo Airport. Well, there you go. I think I've said that a few times in the last two years. Um, so that's the first starting point. Uh, the, the, so the airport is an enterprise fund. What does that mean? Uh, we don't take local county or taxes in revenues from anywhere, but the businesses that operate at the airport, that's where we collect our money. Uh, our annual budget's about $10 million. The, the last piece of these very expensive capital projects, those are what we get FAA grants to help us maintain the airfield. All the rest, the salaries, the insurance, I mean, all maintenance, all those things, are generated through those businesses that operate between the two airports. Okay, thank you. Why is the ALP being done before the noise study is complete? Shouldn't noise issues be addressed before more jets come in? I'll take it again. How about me? Um, so we've heard this from the community um, a few times. Uh, the way I would answer that is the ALP getting that information, quantifying that, helps us to look at what the future may be so that we can put our plan together. So again, I, I think I told you earlier on, uh, I met last week, faced, t talked with our supervisor, Kelly Long, who's here tonight, uh, Supervisor uh, VNA Lopez, and the county's administrator, uh, Dr. Savette Johnson, that they are committed to supporting us and the resources we need for the long, short term and long term on the noise issues. Um, we're going to continue doing those things. Uh, last part of that question, I missed that. Last part of the question was what's that? Uh, should it noise issues be addressed before more jets come in? Yeah. So 
again, we have that commitment. And again, the AOP first gives us an idea of what the future may be. That helps us devise that plan. Not interrelated. Again, the AOP doesn't mean it's our marketing plan. Or what, it's what we think may be in the future. And that helps us devise our response uh, on the noise side of, as we go through this. The forecasts, they're the same numbers. So that kind of just moves, moves us forward. Um, you know, we, we get input. I talked about our supervisors from the county. I see a uh, majority of the city council members, the mayors here from Camarillo. Uh, I met last week with council member Santangelo, Mayor Trembley, and noise was the topic. Again, it is the top issue when we're talking with the city and our own uh, board of supervisors. It is a priority for us. Thank you. Okay, next question. You are sending mixed signals. Patrick pointed out how good the forecast was. Slide 39 in the FAQ tried to downplay the forecasts by pointing out how bad the 1999 forecast was. Are the forecasts good or bad? Patrick, I'm going to give that one to you. <laughs> well, I think we're looking at, if I'm not mistaken, we're comparing a couple different forecasts. One was done back in 1999 with the uh, Part 150 study, and you guys saw that. Those numbers were much higher. General aviation looked different back in the late 90s than it does right now. Um, I think that forecast showed upwards of over 315,000 total operations in the out years of that study, and obviously that didn't come to fruition. We've had a lot of change since then. We've had a recession in 08. We had COVID in 2020. So, I mean, it's understandable to, to get a better sense of what's happened in the general, general aviation community and how that ebbs and flows with the economy and, and other things that transpire um, across the world. So uh, you certainly have that. And then looking at the forecasts now uh, as a part of this 2023-2024 ALP update, we take a lot into consideration when we look at those forecasts. We look nationally at what's happening in the general aviation um, community. Uh, the FAA puts out, every year they put out what they call their FAA aerospace forecasts, and they do a very detailed breakdown of the fleet mix of activity in the general aviation fleet. When you look at those different uh, aircraft, you have single-engine piston aircraft, multi-engine piston, turboprops, jets, helicopters. Uh, the piston-powered aircraft are actually on the decline. Uh, they're not being manufactured at the rate that they have been in the past. Uh, there's not the pilots out there to fly those aircraft like there has been in the past. So when you look at general aviation, you look at the trends, uh, the growth activity uh, right now and really over the last several years, especially since COVID, has been in the turboprop and jet and helicopter market. So when you look at the forecasts that we've derived, you're going to see some growth in those categories because that's what's happening nationally. That's what's happening here regionally as well. We've seen that through some of the trends, some of the discussions that we've had with tenants, looking at the uh, air traffic control tower records. So all those factors go into play, and we understand that it's a forecast. And, uh, you know, we were tasked with doing a 20-year planning forecast with a focus on 10 years for this particular planning study. It's hard enough to focus, you know, 10, 20 years out, let alone five years, but uh, that's what we were tasked with. We have to coordinate those forecasts. They were approved by the FAA, but they were conditionally approved. I think that's important, too, because these forecasts, we know that things aren't going to line out exactly like these forecasts call. Uh, but we do see trends, and we've seen things, you know, happen regionally that lead us to believe that this is something that the airport should plan for so it can continue to maintain its infrastructure and uh, be able to plan accordingly for the different types of fleet mixes that operate at the airport on an annual basis. So I don't know if anybody else has anything they want to add to that. I, I do want to add, I can tell you right now, you know, right now there are four categories, helicopter, piston, turboprop, and jet. If you've seen a newspaper in the last five, five years, you know there's electric engine, airplanes coming, vertical takeoff and EV toll, electric vertical takeoff and landing. Those aren't accounted for, but if you read the paper in the next five to ten years, those will be a part of our lives. Now, the good part is they're quiet, environmentally friendly, those kinds of things, but they're not a category yet, but it's coming. So, again, they're doing their best to, to do the forecast, again, to help us plan. It's not a guarantee, and that's why we showed, you know, it's their best educated guess to what the future is going to be. We don't know for sure. 
Okay, thank you. Next question. New homes are being built adjacent to the airport. Are new homeowners aware of the airport and potential noise? Ooh, a land use question. Um, so, yeah, all new development that's, uh, that, that's coming to this area, um, those, those are uh, considered in, in planning steps. So every time, uh, you know, a project comes forward and it says we're going to do uh, residential uses within uh, some proximity to the airport, um, then it, it gets a special look if, uh, if, if need be. If it's appropriate, then uh, an easement is granted to uh, the airport um, on behalf of the, the developer. And, and, and then separately, as each transaction down the line uh, goes forward, they'll read about an avigation easement, as it's called, in their closing documents that notifies them of the proximity to the airport. So, uh, so, so there's that. Um, you know, but we, we absolutely work with our local jurisdictions to identify uh, sound planning strategies so that we maintain compatibility as one of the prime um, objectives uh, between what the airport's uh, considerations are, our obligations, as we've indicated a couple of times, um, but also what makes sense for our communities to, uh, to, to say that let's not have new ears in, in proximity to the airport where they may be affected by normal air, airport operations. Um, so it, we do our part for compatibility. And the Joint Powers Agreement, the JPA, also spoke to that when it said, please, uh, please work together with the city on, uh, on issues so that we don't increase or put new compatible, non-compatible uses within, uh, within it, a certain perimeter of the airport. So. Those, I oversimplified that, but, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. We're always working at compatibility. So I'd like to add to that. So it, when we're talking about a Part 150 study, uh, we have two um, mandated time horizons. So that's an existing condition and a five-year condition, five-year forecast condition. So we've, we've used the uh, FAA-approved forecast for that five-year condition. But going beyond that, the Department of Airports has elected to do a 20-year forecast uh, set of noise exposure contours, and those uh, contours will be given over to the Airport Land Use Commission, and they those uh, contours will then be used in consideration of a future residential development uh, within the vicinity of the airport. Thank you. Next question. What changed in the last two years to bring in so many jets? We never had this many previously. We have more jets now than ever before. Um, yeah, we do it. We have a do. How do we control the slides? Can, can, we, uh, can we back up to a slide? Sure. Which slide? It was, the, it was the graph with the big yellow box in the center. Ooh. I get to drive. And I'll start by a little bit of input. Um, you know, we did see increases uh, with COVID. Uh, businesses were using more corporate aircraft operations uh, than they did previously. So we did see a, an, an uptick in that area. But go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I, I just wanted to address the, the thought that we've, we've heard a couple of times um, is it's so much busier now than when it, you know, in the last couple of years. And I would say that, that when we looked at it, um, we found that it was fairly consistent for about eight years, looking back for 10, seven, eight years, uh, you know, it was right around. And these numbers are the number of daily jet and turboprops that have been arriving to the airport. Uh, so it's, they, these are, they're going to be flying toward the airport over Old Town. So just so we're clear about that. Um, and, and we saw that it, uh, and boy, those numbers are tiny. I'm sorry. But, it, but we, we, we do see the, the graph ticking up in 2021, which is a real thing. So, yeah, it had a bump there, uh, and, um, and it, it tailed off just a little bit uh, since then. That, you know, that was, a, that was a discovery, I would say, during the pandemic of, uh, of the use of business aircraft uh, and, and especially since it was a bit more risky, or at least the perception that it was risky to be on the, 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 the airlines. 
So, you know, the masking and all the fear about it, uh, it definitely drove uh, companies to rethink the way they move their executives. Um, and so we saw a lot more business flying. And it wasn't just us. It was just nationwide. And so in, in a lot of ways, in most ways, in fact, um, we are a reflection of nationwide trends. Um, because face it, I mean, you don't, you, you know, if you're going to use an airport, you need to land at another airport uh, in a business airplane. Uh, and so we're seeing uh, an uptick as, as you have uh, nationwide in that. So, um, so the numbers show that it sagged the first year in 2020, uh, as you might expect of a pandemic. And then, it, and then it, uh, it, it recovered above historic levels. Um, and so, you know, what we're dealing, um, what's the last number? 16, 16 average arrivals by a jet or a turboprop uh, on a daily, on the average day. Some, some days are going to be busier than that. Some days are uh, pretty quiet. But, uh, but on the average, we're, we're looking, it, it took about a six, five to six uh, daily arrivals by jets and turboprops uh, from going from 2020 to 2021, and it's remained higher, but that's a national trend. So. Great. Thanks, Dave. Okay, next question. Um, can we change the runway configurations to allow planes to come in uh, and take off over this farmland? Landing direction of the planes, especially smaller planes, come on over the farmlands and curve generally at the end to avoid Old Town. Uh, yeah, I'll just quickly answer that. You know, the, the configuration of the runways, that analysis was done 80 years ago. Planes must land and take off into the wind. Uh, so that's the direction that was set. But the, you're getting to the question that we was asked earlier, can we adjust some of the approaches? And those are the things we will be looking at in the noise study. Thank you, Keith. What can the airport county do to ensure the airport users are complying with the JPA? Whose responsibility is it to enforce the joint powers agreement? Uh, that's an easy one. That is the county, and that is our office, you know, through Jeanette, through myself, uh, through our legal counsel, if needed. Uh, those are the things we, resources we have at hand, Board of Supervisors, uh, to, to ensure that uh, our, our users uh, of the airports um, comply with the Joint Powers Agreement. Why are planes allowed to fly between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m., which are Camarillo's quiet hours? Why can't planes fly over the open fields instead of directly over residents? Again, two-part question we've answered a few times. We can't just set restrictions on our own, uh, but we are working with tenants um, on the quiet hours, not flying when and if they didn't need to, don't need to. Um, and the last part of that is, again, looking at opportunities. We will do that in as we progress in the noise study areas. We're already doing it. The uh, Fly Friendly program that Jeanette is, is doing now is doing those kinds of things with the smaller airplane pilots because they're more maneuverable, we have more flexibility, it's easier to, to work with them. The issues we have right now with Old Town are the FAA-approved approach pattern, much more complicated for us to adjust that, but those are the things we'll look at. Okay, another question kind of going off that one. Uh, will there be any penalties or fines to repeat offenders who may continue to use the airport during the courtesy curfew hours? Back to the, to the noise, we can't make up rules and we can't fine people for a voluntary uh, program. That would be outside the, the FAA's 1990 ANCA. But again, we will encourage and work with tenants. And, and I'll be very candid with you. Our discussions with the businesses and the pilots uh, at our two airports, they want to be good neighbors. They live in these neighborhoods. So that they, they want to be good neighbors and they've been great to work with. Uh, and, and Candy Light have not had any pushback. It's about educating them. Some of them have to operate for their business and do things, but they're very open to working with us uh, and being good neighbors. Okay, this is a three-part question. Would you discern between turboprop and jet going forward? 
How do we take action to change the JPA to minimize jets? How are or are there any studies on, health, on the health effects of the airport? Would you discern bete between turbo prop and jet going forward? Okay, uh, turbo props and jets. So it, um, it's a it's a bit of a for for those who um, uh, wanted to know physically the difference between those. A, a, they both have jet engines. Uh, the jet itself, when you say jet, we're talking about those that don't have any propellers on them. A turbo prop has a propeller, but it's also driven by a jet engine, and so that's the the, the distinguishing characteristic. Um, they're tracked separately by FAA, so we can get numbers distinguished uh, between those two, uh, and, uh, and and sources were were used by our consulting team to uh, to parse into that data and and just distinguish between them, uh, and and it's because of the fact that FAA provides us that data that says here's the you know here's these different groups those that have a piston engine those that have uh, two piston engines those that have you know are driven by turboprops and those that are jets. And also the helicopters. Uh, I would say the distinguishing characteristics of a jet is that uh, you know you see it that they're a little bit bigger typically, um, and uh, but they move quicker, so they're not over your home as long as a turboprop. A turboprop is coming in; they're going a little bit slower. They have that prop that's making a different frequency of noise that you might find to be. Uh, maybe not to your liking. You, you, you don't like it, or maybe that's not as bad as a jet. You know, there's going to be some individual um, differences in the way that's perceived. Um, but it's also going to be a little slower going over your home. So you're going to notice it longer. The event is going to have a longer duration um, for, for that purpose. Dave, can I dive into that? Yes. Uh, and a key note in the categories, again, it is how the FAA categories, helicopter, piston, turboprop, jet the most important for us which i think most of you that are concerned about noise is what is causing again this is the analysis we use and how we're going to put our resources the most important stat uh, that jeanette put up earlier is a 65 two-thirds of our noise complaints are related to jet airplanes 3.5 percent of turboprop so i'm not saying that they're not important but we know where our problem is that is all helping us identify where we put our resources and things we want to work on. So I'll add. Uh, part two was the JPA, right? How do we change the JPA? Okay. Um, yes, well, it's, it's a grandfathered thing. So we, uh, we're, we can't monkey with it. If we, if we change it, if we add new things restricting it, um, that's the same thing as, as we've talked about that we just can't do because of the same of the same regulation, so um, it helps us, uh, and and so to that extent, we we nurture it, we love it, we obey it, um, we we uh, we let it do its its pleasant work for you, because now we don't make any changes to our role. We don't look at larger, heavier, whatever kinds of airplanes. We let the JPA do that for us, but we unfortunately can't strengthen it without running afoul of the uh, of, of the things that keep us from just putting unilateral restrictions on on aircraft. It's it's federally preempted. So, and then the last part to that was: Are there any studies on the health effects of the airport? So I'll add to what uh, Aaron was saying earlier. So there, there's a, a list of capital improvement projects uh, outlined in the uh, airport. Uh, layout plan narrative report. And as those projects are considered, they um, need to go through an environmental process. So this is either a, a federal process, so this is a National Environmental Policy Act, or um, or, or CEQA locally. Um, so each of those studies has, um, in, in certain cases, FAA would require um, additional noise analysis uh, for a project. Um, or and or uh, would also require evaluation of uh, air pollutant emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. And so there are actually thresholds that go along with those, and those could be studied on, on a project-by-project -project basis. Again, I, I want to stress 
because we live in California, you have the national NEPA process. We also have California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. So both of those, because we live in California, have to be uh, addressed. Okay. Do any of you meet with the FAA on a regular basis? Are you able to provide concerns from Camarillo citizens, possibly influence them? I'll answer that. Uh, yes, we do. Um, for the grant process, we've met with them. They've actually attended our Part 150 noise study. They actually had our um, staff members assigned to Camarillo Oxnard Airports have attended the noise study so they could see the community input uh, at those meetings and they already. Our 150 projects. And they supported you know, us giving, getting us the grant, for one for each airport. Uh, so they are involved in it, yes. Okay, next question. If there is a plane crash in one of our neighborhoods, who is liable and for how much? Uh, no comment. Okay, next question. What action are you taking to reduce noise concerns? It sounds like there is an increase in the number of jets coming into the airport or using airport without limit on landing time, how will you reduce noise with the increase in noise producing traffic? I, I think we've answered that a few times. Uh, again, we've, we've hired somebody who, first time ever for the airports, dedicated, Jeanette Haregi, uh, dedicated to uh, helping us uh, work on noise issues, getting information out to our community, working with uh, base pilots, um, corporations based at the airport, the businesses at the airport, um, trying to stay away from flying during our quiet hours. Um, and then we talked about uh, the next steps we're, we're doing on, uh, with, with the noise study. So all of those things are helping us be better neighbors. How can pilots who are also community members support you? And how do you prioritize projects? Well, let me just take a quick, quick shot of that. I mean, what you, in that question, what you hear is we're looking for a balance, right? The airport's been here for 80 years. There's, there's value to the businesses and the pilots that operate here. We also have community members in, in cities that, that adjoin and buffer uh, the airports. So we're looking for that balance. It's, it's a business. It's an operation, it's a transportation system, and we're trying to balance that with the concerns over noise, environmental issues, those kinds of things. So that, that's our role is to balance those. Dave, anything? Yeah, I, I think I would just, uh, I would say two things. On one side of the coin is uh, be, be flying neighborly. to recognize that there's a, there, there are good times to fly over populations, and there are less friendly times to do that, or definitely less friendly ways to fly over too high uh, to you know whatever there's there's a there's a number of ways to not fly your airplane as friendly as you can so we would ask that you you know use good pilot techniques uh, and choose good times to fly when you can uh, but I would also say that uh, that lots and lots and lots of good things happen at airports and uh, and we try to tell those stories too and it isn't just people who are, you know, operating businesses and want greed. Uh, they're, you know, profit over everything. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of good things that happen at airports. And so we'd like to just ask our pilot community for sure and everybody else to just listen for the good stories. Uh, Jeanette's also helping us talk and find, uh, find the good stories about how uh, pilots are using their airplanes to uh, to do things like um, survey birds uh, on the Channel Islands or fly pets out of harm's way uh, to from from kill shelters to no kill shelters. I mean, uh, uh, teaching kids about um, about math and science. Um, you know, all the different kinds of things that that we do that aviation gets in the blood of people. You know, uh, from in a good way. And so we want to we want to ask people to listen for the good stories at what happens to airports, and uh, and and to let that sink in a little bit. 
um, but as particularly to our pilot community to be kind of good ambassadors for the way you fly and the kinds of stories that you share with, with people in your community about the good things happening in aviation. Okay, slide 32 and 46 regarding large cargo. Is there small cargo currently occurring or planned? What size is large versus small? So do we want to go to slide 32? Uh, no, I would just say uh, the, the JPA does allow some cargo, and it's uh, below 7,500 pounds, I believe, uh, per, per flight, which is pretty small. I mean, that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's a pretty small airplane that's going to be flying that amount of cargo. So we may see that from time to time. There's nobody currently operating on a regular basis at Camarillo. We do have a little bit of that activity happening at Oxnard Airport. So it's allowed in, in very small doses at both airports. Uh, and, um, uh, and so, yeah, we, we, we see some of that. But that would be, that would be pretty minuscule. Nobody, nobody would start a cargo operation at that scale. Um, so it's just, a, it's just a little bit of a floor for that kind of activity, recognizing that it could be out there and still considered to be general aviation. Um, but I, I looked at early documents, uh, uh, iterations of, uh, of what became the JPA, uh, and there was some discussion about the fact that GA, uh, general aviation, did include that small amount of cargo activity uh, within it, but clearly no passenger airline activity, like none of that. Um, and that was made very clear, and, and we acknowledge that and support that. Okay. <clears throat> Why are departures limited, but arrivals can continue anytime? A jet landed this morning at 4.40 a.m. Yeah, I, yeah, that's something that was decided back in 1976, and, and there was an amendment in 1985, but that was before all of our time when that decision was made. Okay, next question. What happens when flights exceed 90 decibels and what action is taken against? Is there a fine imposed? How exactly does the city of Camarillo benefit financially from these types of planes? So the, the 90 decibel, um, and we did in, in the uh, analysis for the, the noise study, um, there was modeling. That's typically how you do the, the bulk of, of the analysis uh, for the Part 150 noise study. Uh, then we did additional on top of that, or at our own cost, uh, noise sampling for several months. Um, and out of the 3,000 individual aircraft noise um, captures, uh, events that we captured, uh, there was one. And it was basically a, a, a 1960-era uh, military jet that came in. So we don't see the, the 90 decibels on, on any. In fact, we had community members say, well, I, I've picked those up. We've actually, Jeanette and I and Dave, have gone out and trying to recreate that, and we don't get anywhere near that, even on the end of the runway. So uh, we'll work with those individuals if they, uh, they say they're still getting those. Um, but we're simply, we haven't seen that. If we were, then we would take steps that would be part of, you know, a deviation from the Joint Powers Agreement and look at what we needed to do to address that issue. This is probably similar from before. Why do planes fly so low over residences, and who is going to protect us from pollution? I'll, I'll handle the low part. Um, so the the regulation says that aircraft are, uh, should maintain a safe altitude except when takeoff and landing. So it's up to pilots' uh, discretion and technique as to how they fly that final approach course into the airport. So we would we would expect and we would hope that they're flying with good technique that doesn't have uh, any any adverse impact above what you might hope. Uh, on on the ground, um, but occasionally there's going to be a pilot that that flies a little bit lower, uh, or uses um, not a great technique, and it causes more noise than you might expect. Um, and so what we just do is encourage pilots to 
stay as high as they can uh, as, as they do their final approach course to the airport. So, And let me just add to that. Uh, pilots are trained. Altitude is your friend. You know, you, you, they want to be as high as they can. If, if they need to do something, they have more options. So they're <coughs> typically not, they're not trained, not typically, they're not trained to fly low. They're trained to get as high altitude as they can, as fast as they can. That's, that's the norm. And the environmental question, and it was a, the last piece, I think uh, that's been answered a few times, of each project has to go through its individual uh, environmental analysis, <coughs> both national and state requirements. Is there any general aviation airport anywhere that has developed a novel or successful noise abatement program? Please describe. That, that is a great question, and that is exactly why we're doing the noise studies. Is we've, we've hired a national firm to help us go through the process, who's done this many times, but those are the things we look at. And there are, you know, we mentioned a few of those, looking at the approach path, doing that analysis. That's just one thing, working with pilots to land over ag, um, opposite direction, not over Old Town. <laughs> the list goes on. And um, so... Uh, we will look at nationally what's going on. What types of increase in not large commercial aircraft is going to be allowed? So what types of increase in not large commercial aircraft is going to be allowed? Uh, okay, so I, I would assume that means that it's within the JPA's constraints. So less than 115,000 pounds, um, and almost all of our traffic is, is well below that. Um, so uh, we're, we're a little bit like the 101 uh, freeway. Uh, what you get coming down the road is what it is. Uh, and so what we do is we just acknowledge that, that there's some national trends. We forecast accordingly, um, but we're not out there um, trying to make it happen. Um, but we're also not able to say uh, that we can constrain it. We can't say, okay, that many of that size airplane and that's it. Um, we just have to be ready for, for what that looks like uh, as, as those trends evolve in, in the nation's airspace. And, and let me add to that. You know, I've heard, um, you know, the ALP is going to open the floodgates and, and all these things are happening. Remember, as as much as we love this county and love this area, the operations that come in here are coming for a reason. Either they live here or they're doing business here. They're not just flying in for fun. They're, they're coming here for a reason. So, I mean, that's kind of the limitation. If you're doing business in L.A., you're not going to fly into Camarillo and then go drive into L.A. You're going to go, you're going to, go to Van Nuys go to Burbank, and go to those other, you're going to the place you want to go. It's kind of like the analogy, and, and my staff hates my analogies, but I'll just work with me for a second, is your garage in your car. How about I told you that your garage was going to be five miles from your house? How useful would that be to you? No, you, you want it next to your house. That's the same as your, your airplane. You, you operate from the area that you're going to be using it. So, again, the floodgates, we don't see that. We see a, a growth, which is, you know, that's in the projections. What they're seeing across the United States in areas like us, that's the kind of steady growth. We're projecting, as you've seen with some of the graphs, it might not be high. It might go up and down. That's typically what happens. Over time, we could have a recession. That will slow things down. That happens. And I, I might add to that, too, just <clears throat> when you look at the... <coughs> existing and future critical aircraft because that's one of the components of the forecast and Patrick identified the Gulfstream 650 which is one of the largest corporate aircraft in the fleet and that's operating right now at this airport on the threshold for the FAA to consider it the critical design aircraft which is at least 500 operations per year 500 takeoffs and landings combined and this ALP doesn't project anything bigger than that 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 aircraft falls what's in called the D3 category for a runway design code. And I don't mean to get all technical on you, but when you look at the approach speed of the aircraft as it comes into land as well as the wingspan, that, that's what makes up that alphanumeric coding system. So 
That's occurring right now on the threshold of what would be considered the critical design aircraft, and, and we're projecting that that type of aircraft, that family of aircraft, to continue to operate on that threshold uh, through the planning period of this study. And it, it's considered, it's one of the largest aircraft in the general aviation fleet. So. Okay, next question. What can be done to mitigate the increase in air traffic and related noise that will occur when Santa Monica Airport closes? How can we limit the increase in charter flight traffic? Well, I, I guess we've, we've said a couple of different times we're not in the we're, we're not able to limit anything. So we may observe some changes in uh, in the patterns of of aircraft and ownership of aircraft, aircraft uh, and where they choose to fly in and out of. Uh, but Keith just made a case that it's uh, you know it's there's a proximity factor, you know, proximity to where you live or where your business is. So that's going to be a factor. It, it would need to be convenient for people to be in Camarillo if that was the case. Um, and, uh, and yeah, but we, we've said a couple times we're, we're not able to limit anything uh, within the class of airplanes that already fits at Camarillo Airport. And we're not changing the airport to accommodate any bigger airplanes than that. And I would add uh, Santa Monica shortened its runway years ago. So the, most of the corporate jets are already gone. So now that's remaining are the, the flight schools and, and smaller piston airplanes. Going back to what I said, what Dave said, now you've got a flight school. Kind of difficult to come all the way to Camarillo and, and start flight training operations, particularly since we already have flight schools at our airport. Now you're competing out of your area. Um, so, again, more than likely, as, as the jet's already filtered uh, to other local airports that are closer to Santa Monica than us, Burbank, LAX, uh, Van Nuys. Do you have anything to add, Corey? You good? What I, I would just add that you know we we do have these time horizons that we're looking at in the noise study. So we have the existing condition and, and five year forecast, and then twenty year forecast. So we are, um, from a noise perspective and land use planning perspective, including those uh, anticipated increases in operations, um, at the from a land use planning standpoint. Okay, thank you. Speaking of flight operations, what percentage of flight operations are for flight trainings? Okay. Yeah, so the airport last year did one, approximately 187,000 operations total. Operations are split into what they consider local operations, which are typically tied to aircraft that stay in the, in the traffic pattern, flight training activity primarily, and then itinerant operations, which could be anywhere from a small single engine aircraft up to a business jet that either, either is flying into the airport from another location or departing this airport to go somewhere else. So according to the activity, um, of those 187,000 operations, about 103,000 were tied to local operations. So yeah, about 60% of those operations would have been uh, related to probably more typical to flight training activity. So about a 60-40 split on the uh, local to itinerant. Great. Thanks, Matt. Will cargo and big airlines come to, Cam to Camarillo? Large air cargo and airlines, no. Next question. Infrastructure plan. Any plan for improving sustainability, um, i.e. solar power, charging, or electrification? 100%. Uh, we're already doing electric uh, EV charging stations at both airports. Um, we just got a request, as a matter of fact, in the last 30 days to put solar panels on the airport, which uh, we'd love to do if it's a fit. Um, would need FAA approval and, and all kinds of other things, but yes. Follow up similar to that. Uh, what is the definition of cargo operations? Well, um, large car cargo operations would be anything that doesn't fit under the JPA, which would be a, a, a cargo operation 
uh, where they implane at least 7,501 pounds of cargo into a, into an airplane, and that they're in that business to to move that freight between airports. And this would be one of the two airports that it that it did. So, uh, so that would be non-qualifying. So a a business of moving air cargo uh, in airplanes and using uh, more than 7,500 pounds as your nominal cargo amount that, that you're flying. So um, we're, we're here to, to state unequivocally that anything above that is not welcome at, at uh, Camarillo Airport, as was provided in the JPA, which we stand behind. And I'd like to just add a bit to that. You know, the concept that large air cargo was going to Amazon, you, you, that was a question earlier. Those freight movers are looking for 100 acres to set up their business operation. We don't have that available to do those kinds of, never mind the airplanes and the size of airplanes that they want to move cargo with. It's just not a fit for Camarillo Airport. As part of the ALP, are changes being made to the taxiways? Simply, the, the answer is yes, as you saw in some of the diagrams, and those changes are to meet new standards. So you'll see that in red, I think, one of the... Yeah, I think the, uh, the FAA has taken particular interest the last several years on uh, runway incursion mitigation. So any taxiway that's not aligned perpendicular to the runway system, they want to see that realigned 90 degrees to oh, the runway system. I'll, I'll interpret for... For consultant speak, I was getting there, Keith. Runway, Come on. Oh, okay, runway incursion. So you see they're jagged, they're offset, right? So when you're coming from the ramp, they don't want an airplane just to have a straight shot to the runway so that they have to make turns to keep them from going onto the runway as other planes are landing or taking off. So they want to make it more difficult, not a straight line. So that's what Matt's describing in his. You said it great. <laughs> I have no Sorry. further comment. <laughs> okay, next question. Do noise studies take structures, especially, especially new and planned, into consideration? Considering noise has increased since new hangars were built, including freeway noise. So do noise studies take structures, especially new and planned, into consideration? So the... The noise study does not um, include structures, um, but in certain cases, you could evaluate the effectiveness of a, a, a noise barrier. Um, and so those, uh, we have undertaken that type of study um, if it is uh, recommended that a uh, you know, noise barrier be constructed. Um, however, I will note that those are only effective until the, uh, the aircraft has exceeded the height of the barrier. So this is, uh, you know, it's going to continue to emit noise, um, you know, if the aircraft is uh, departing. Uh, once it, if the, if the receptor is a home and there is a, a, a barrier, once the aircraft is above that barrier, then the, the noise is still emitted and, and would still be heard at the, uh, the receptor being the, the home or the residence. Anybody want to add anything? Good? Okay. Oh, okay. Corey, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I, I think the one additional point to, that, to answer that question is that the part when the forecast, which is a projection into the future, all that increased traffic or operations is accounted for in the Part 150 noise study and is included in that analysis, whether it is attached to a structure or not. Yes, that's, that's correct. Okay. Why won't the city of Camarillo and the county of Ventura fight the FAA like the city of Santa Monica did? Well, Santa Monica is looking to shut down the airport, and at this point, um, that is not the direction from Ventura County or the city. Thank you. Can we limit the use of our airport by celebrities with jets 
who find it more convenient to land here than other nearby airports? I'll answer that two ways is you've heard the, you know, we can't be selective of who we preclude from using these facilities. Uh, but I'll stress um, all of the businesses uh, that do corporate aircraft operations have stressed that 90% of their operations are business related. So um, that's the bulk of, of those operations. Wouldn't it be smarter to evaluate other flight path alternatives before submitting this airport layout plan to the FAA funding with a 20-year commitment? So wouldn't it be smarter to evaluate other flight path alternatives before submitting this plan to the FAA for funding with a 20-year commitment? Um, I'll take that. Uh, so the, the, the approval of the airport layout plan uh, is is really just to keep us in compliance with uh, with a requirement that we keep one on file and current with FAA before they uh, give us funding that we'll need to f primarily redo the runway uh, because it, it needs to be rebuilt and it needs to be rebuilt to the FAA standards. So we need that we need that funding support to do that. So that's that's primarily what this project is about is to is to help FAA help us. Um, so to the point about, uh, oh man, I just blanked. Let's read the flight path. Um, yes, it was. I can take it. I can Wouldn't take it be it. smarter to evaluate other flight paths? Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it was, it was the, the point about what, uh, what, what approving the airport layout plan does. So the, the, the approval of the airport layout plan doesn't bring in, uh, it doesn't trigger any projects for, for capacity. It doesn't help us meet uh, other, you know, other demand levels. Uh, we've already talked about n not having, not accommodating other larger air airplanes. Um, so the, the really delaying the airport layout plan uh, would, would not be a, uh, it is something that, that moves, the, moves the ball forward. Um, so I'll let Keith take. Well, and again, just finishing what I'd said before is that actually paints the picture for us what to expect so we know what resources in the noise side of it that, that we should be prepared to contribute, again, short-term and long-term. Are single noise violators tracked historically and are violators projected? Uh, as, as mentioned earlier, in our analysis that we did and the individual monitoring we did, there was just one instance of that. And again, if you read the JPA, it's on us to not allow more of those to happen. And, and again, that was a one-off with a 1960 military aircraft that does not typically operate uh, at our airport. When the runway is reconstructed, what will the runway weight bearing capacity be for single wheel, do wheel, double dual, tandem, et cetera? So I'm not going to be able to break it down uh, based on the uh, different types of wheel configurations, but the uh, strength is going to be in compliance with the JPA. So 115,000 pounds and, uh, and, and that, frankly, we're actually, uh, the current critical aircraft uh, only qualifies us for funding at 100,000 pounds. So we're actually planning to uh, have the strength be under the JPA, allowed weight for aircraft coming in. Isn't it a big mistake to remove high-speed turnoffs by reducing the width of taxiway to runway intersections? Even small aircraft benefit by having rounded, wide runway exits like, like freeway exits. So isn't it a big mistake to remove high-speed turnoffs? So I would say here at Camarillo Airport, we do have a high-speed exit. Uh, as we go through final design 
we would be working with the FAA, the Air Traffic Control Tower, uh, to analyze whether we try to keep a high-speed exit or not. Uh, it, it does not meet typical FAA design standards, but sometimes there's justifications, uh, especially for moving airplanes off the runway environment more quickly, and it can be preferred by other branches of the FAA that operate locally that we do so. So we'll be doing that coordination during design. Okay, next question. My assumption is the majority of the noise is military related. Does the county verify it is in fact an aircraft in and out of Camarillo? Uh, so I'll answer that is, you know, that's part of what Jeanette does in her analysis. Um, again, because we have purchased that flight tracking system, we can identify airplanes that come in and out. If, it, if one does not correlate coming in or out of Camarillo, again, she has contacts. Um, and some of our systems can track the, the military as well. Um, so that's part of what we do is identifying where the noise is coming from. Okay, we have a comment on, about slide 41. The data on slide 41 does not match the data in the table. Uh, if the ALP is, da is data-driven, we need to get the data correct. So maybe we could just go over slide 41 again. Can you repeat the question again? Yeah, the data on slide 41 does not match the data in table 2N and table 2Q. <laughs> So he's summary. asking if you'll go over the data again to make sure that it's correct. Sure, I can address that. Um, <clears throat> this one is not related to those two tables. There was, in fact, a typo in 2Q, and that has been updated. So you all can, can get the updated table. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. With jet flights anticipated to really triple over the next 20 years, how concerned are you about the greatly increased amount of pollution that will be generated? I mean, I guess our response would be is, as discussed, each project, whether it's a taxiway or a hangar project, has to go through national and in California environmental process. So, you know, there is a process to analyze each um, project as it comes through. I, I, would, just, I would just say that uh, we've, we've heard about electric propulsion uh, as coming into, into our aviation inventory, things that fly. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see some benefits accrue to the entire system from that. We also have uh, what's called sustainable aviation fuel which is burned by jet airplanes. Uh, the, the, the engine itself doesn't know the difference. The source, though, is from uh, some other industrial process or uh, plant biomass, things like that. Um, so we're, we're seeing that benefit coming into aviation. Uh, SAF, or Sustainable Aviation Fuel, uh, is or has been available at uh, Camarillo Airport. Um, and then we also have other kinds of fuels uh, for burning um, by piston engines. And uh, those uh, that that's going to have uh, have the lead removed from it, so uh, so a no lead fuel. So we're going to see some some good strides in uh, in environmental sustainability in the aviation sector, and, and of course we'll enjoy uh, the benefits of that as well as well at our two airports. Okay, next question: How do I get involved in the noise study? That's you, Corey. So if we, after the meeting, uh, you can see Jeanette, and Jeanette can, uh, if, you, if you give her your email address, uh, you'll be notified um, when the next uh, round of meetings has been scheduled. Um, so that, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we're anticipating that to be in uh, May of 2024. Uh, additionally, if you haven't seen the study website, uh, I can give you the, uh, the URL for that uh, where you can read um, the materials that have been produced for the noise study to date. Um, and then uh, I'd, I'd be uh, happy to talk with you about the noise study as well uh, after the meeting. Great. Thanks, Corey. 
Is it possible to eliminate explosions that occur during the Wings Over Camarillo Air Show in August and supersonic aircraft flybys as well? The noise has a significant impact on pets and humans alike. I can tell you that the aircraft, the, the, the military uh, jet aircraft, uh, the fire fighter aircraft that has been uh, at the show last year um, is not going to be back at this point. So we're working with the community. Um, we've got our, our uh, animal shelter in the area. All of those are concerns for us, so we're working on that. Even the explosions, uh, those have been tapered down. We'll continue to work with um, the pyrotechnics folks and, and the operators of the air show uh, to, to, to do a better balance. Yes. Okay. Uh, is it true that jets on instrument approaches fly at altitudes mandated by the FAA? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Knowing that plane traffic will increase significantly over the next 10 to 15 years, would anyone on the panel buy a home in Old Town? Well, I would, but that's a bias. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I've been doing this for 30 plus years. I, you know, it, it is a choice. I, I understand. Okay. Next question. I understand that the FAA grant funding became an option in the 1970s. During which years since then have we raised FAA funding? During which years since then have we raised FAA grant funding? So that would mean to accept grants, I, I presume. Yeah. So I would say most years. Yep, it's a, it, it's a good source of, of things that we need to keep a facility in, uh, in good condition. So we, we, welcome, uh, we welcome their support. What is the reason for narrowing the, the runway? It's simply to meet current FAA design standards, which for our critical aircraft, the G650 only requires a 100-foot wide runway. OK. Uh, why, why expand airport to allow more jets? Why allow airport expansion? Why allow more traffic? Why take, take FAA money? So I would answer that, uh, again, it's not about expansion, it's about meeting the standards uh, and maintaining what we have. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, we take the grant funding to help us with those expensive infrastructure. We're an enterprise fund, so we pay for a majority of, again, salaries and, and things like that to maintain the airport, but these expensive capital um, projects as airports across the country, uh, including LAX and Burbank uh, and smaller airports, uh, take these funding for the capital projects. Okay, we have one last question that's unique, and uh, we'll follow this up with if anybody has any remaining questions, you can raise your hand and we'll come over to you with a microphone. And we'll give you about two minutes to ask your question. Okay, any thought of rebuilding the runway at Oxnard uh, to, to, handing, to, to handling heavier traffic? So any thought of rebuilding the runway at Oxnard? to handling heavier traffic? So uh, what I would say is that our, uh, currently we have an, an ALP for Oxnard Airport that is current, and there are no plans uh, to bring in heavier aircraft than what's already dictated by the plan. So uh, the answer currently is... Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add to that. That is a great question because it gets to the point that the FAA is not a build it and they will come. That's why you've heard a lot about the critical airplane, 500 operations that are at Camarillo. That's what you can design to because those are there. Not, oh, hey, we think it's going to be, you know, we're going to have seven, four, seven. That's not happening, right? 
but we can't have these bigger. It's not a, give us the funding because we want larger, heavier airplanes. They don't support that. It's what you have now is what you can build it to, the critical airplane. Wonderful. Thank you, panel. And, of course, the public, we appreciate you guys. Jeanette, you want to come on up? Apologies for the interruption. I just wanted to make sure before anyone else leaves, there's a typo on my email address. You'll see my, my, na my first and last name spelled um, correctly on top. So my email address has two N's. Uh, so just for any of those reaching out, I have some of my business cards with me also. Um, quick uh, add-on to what Corey mentioned is you're welcome to come speak to me when the questions are done. Uh, if you go to our website, there's an option to join our mailing list, and you will be added automatically to our email um, mailing list. Okay, with that, if anybody has any outstanding questions unique to what we've already heard, raise your hand and somebody will approach you with a microphone. Please say your name and go ahead, Rachel. Hi, my name is Meryl Berge, and I have to say that it is really uh, hard to believe that you will take our concerns seriously when you put up, you don't put up, the most important line in the JPA about the 90 decibel single noise event. It's really hard to take you seriously, that you're going to take us seriously, when you discount one noise, 90 decibel noise event being from a military plane. When you know in this room there is old town neighbors with lived experience of more than that. In fact, in your noise monitoring study, there were over 50 events in a one-week study time, one week's time period, of 90-plus decibel avoidance. So how the heck are we supposed to trust that this noise study, which should inform the uh, airport layout plan, in fact, on your organization chart, it talks about how that should be part of your airport layout plan. And another slide shows where the feasibility of alternative flight paths should be considered. It seems that we will lose all leverage if, in fact, the APL is funded and we're obligated and there is no incentive for you to take us seriously. Thank you, Mary. Any comment from the panel? Just if anybody wants to. Corey, you want to start? Yeah, so I think um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll read it aloud. So this is the, the part of the, the JPA that's been referenced a few times this evening. Uh, so it says, airport development shall be guided to ensure that residential areas are not exposed to noise levels greater than 60 CNEL, so that's community noise equivalent level, CNEL average noise, and 90 DBA, so that's A-weighted decibels, single event noise. I think there is some, it, it, so as we start talking about this, um, so we're, it, it, as I read this as a practitioner of airport land use compatibility planning, I see that as you know, the first question is um, whether or not residential development would be allowed within an area exposed or area within a 60 CNEL noise exposure contour. So that, those are the types of contours that we've developed uh, as part of the Part 150 study. Uh, they're also included in the airport land use compatibility plan. So you have your, you know, the, the FAA threshold is 65 CNEL. And then uh, in, in in the previous Part 150 study, uh, you know, we, we looked at a 60 CNEL noise exposure contour. So this, uh, in airport land use compatibility planning uh, and consideration of development proposals, uh, if a, a project proponent came forward 
and they had they were proposing residential development the question would be asked is this residential development within a 60 CNEL noise exposure contour so that would you know if if that parcel was within the contours the uh, you know the recommendation would be that that not be allowed um, so similarly as we're as we're talking about this um, it, it, to me, it is not a question of whether or not I, it has been measured at that site uh, to be above uh, 90. Uh, similarly, you would look at a single event contour, which is developed with the same type of modeling software. Um, so you would look at a, a specific aircraft, but potentially the loudest aircraft that operates at an airport, develop a noise exposure contour with that, and, and repeat that process. So looking at a cumulative uh, uh, noise map and then also a single event uh, contour map. CL max chart, the statement that there was oh, multiple. That, that there were uh, multiple events above 90, right? So that, that kind of gets back to this, the question. It, it, it's not, to me, looking at the, the JPA, it is not a question as to whether or not um, events are, are or are not allowed uh, at above uh, 90 dB um, in terms of a, a, a maximum uh, allowable uh, noise level. Um, it is, is more of a, a question of land use planning and, and evaluating uh, development proposals with respect to cumulative noise contours, which is that 60 CNEL noise exposure contour. Uh, and then also uh, a different type of contour, which is a, a single event contour. Corey, could you describe the chart that Merrill talked about, that there was multiple 90, that is not an L max number? That's a, Correct, that's so the, the uh, SEL value. So that's a, a sound exposure level value, uh, which is a separate, um, that, that is a sound exposure level is something that can't be heard. Uh, by the human ear. It is a mathematical representation of a noise event. So that is uh, noise energy that is compressed into a one second uh, uh, time frame. And then you can compare the noise energy from event to event. Some events are longer, some are shorter, um, some are louder overall, and, and some are quieter. But the, that is a way to compare uh, different events uh, at the same site. So I, I would add to that. Um... Again, um, taking seriously, that's what we've been doing for the last two years. It's why Jeanette is part of our team. It is the tr flight tracking system we're doing. It's the noise uh, flight friendly program. It's the part 150 noise study. So to say we're not hearing or acknowledging, that's why we're here doing what we're doing. I, this hasn't been brought up, but I'll point this out. ALP meeting, uh, processes don't have a public component to them. These meetings we've had are because we've added that to communicate what's happening. Instead of the master plan, we wanted to keep people updated for the ALP process. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Okay, next question. Ma'am, if you'll stand up. It's a, in, Hi. Say your name. Yes, my name is Renee Hatcher. I am a resident of Old Town. Um, I'm going to jump on what Merrill already said. I understand you're saying the noise re reports that your own report has is not being counted. Um, but you can see why, as a community, we have a hard time believing or trusting what you're saying when we're relying on reports. Forgive me for using my phone. I'm looking at your noise study report that there were 760 events in that week or so that the noise monitors were out, 760 events that registered 80 to 90 decibels, 63 events that were 90 to 100, and three events over 100 decibels. That's your own report, and we're a member of the public. We're reading that, and that is alarming information to have you tell us that there's another math Process, FAA math, <laughs> I don't know, that's done to tell us that this isn't happening really makes us not want to trust what we're being told here. So I hope you can understand that. As a community, we're seeing these numbers. I have a noise, I have a decibel reader in my home. 
I have several neighbors that have purchased them as well. Some are in the industry, and so they have calibrated equipment. They are getting these readings. And maybe that's anecdotal, but it supports what you have on your report as well. It's concerning to us, as Meryl's saying, it makes it very difficult for us to sit here and agree and want to believe everything you're saying when your own report is now being discounted. Thank you. Can we answer the, what is those multiple readings, uh, anybody? So all those readings, can you discuss all the readings? They're not DB, they're not L max numbers, decibel readings, right? Yeah, so the, the I believe the, the table that you're talking about has the SEL values. And so those, are, again, the, that's a, uh, a calculation uh, that's that noise energy compressed into one second. Corey, Corey maybe I could help okay. in lay terms. It's not a decibel reading, dB reading of 90 or 100 of what you're seeing. It is a, another metric that the FAA requires them to do to help them look. It's not a dB. It is time and energy. And we can, we can talk individually, but there is a column that's L max. Those are the individual decibel readings tied consistent with what the JPA is looking at. Thank you. Okay, next question in the back there. Hi. Good evening. I'm Colleen Delaney. I'm a 20-plus year resident of Old Town Camarillo. Turns out I'm piggybacking off these other ones. Um, first, I want to say thank you very much for this evening. I realize it's been a very long day for you all, and so I appreciate that. Um, my question also relates to the noise, but also the, the frequency, and I want to point out that per one of the Kaufman Associates at the last meeting, I was told that the Part 150 study modeling does not work for general aviation airports, that they were testing, the FAA was taking questions about it, but it seemed like it does not work for us. So my question was, what else is the airport department doing to accurately account for noise? And the example I also want to bring up is that everybody focuses on the 90 degree, but times have changed since 1970s, and we realize that noise nuisance is a problem. I am nice. I only call the airport when I re get decibel readings of over 80. That is from inside my house. And so, and there are times that I'll have three to four jets landing within 10 minutes at over 80. So I would appreciate a comments about other ways that the uh, department is going to look at noise and how that affects the residents of, of Old Town Camarillo, because that is also health related if it's constantly at 80 degrees. And I am, I, my house is one of the very last before the uh, runway, and I volunteer my back deck for a long-term study, preferably two to three months, where you can videotape, uh, take decibel readings, and maybe particulate noise, so you can actually accurately see what we are experiencing in Old Town Camarillo, because as we know, many of the data that's in the report are averages. And so, yes, some days I might have nothing, but other days, and I'm not exaggerating, I will have five, six jets in 25 minutes, 20 minutes. Thank you. So to the question about whether or not uh, Part 150 studies are effective for general aviation airports, I, I, that person's not here, but I, I do know uh, where the comment's coming from. Um, so the, the Part 150 program uh, was, uh, you know, initially envisioned in the early 80s. Um, airports would go through the process, uh, develop noise exposure contours. And I think one thing that we haven't touched on is whether or not, uh, you know, so that the, the threshold is the 65 CNEL noise exposure contour. So the, just in general, the process from a Part 150 standpoint, uh, study standpoint is that you would develop noise exposure contours, uh, annual average condition, uh, 60, 65, uh, 65 CNAL noise exposure contours are developed at the existing condition and that five-year forecast uh, horizon. And then with that mapping, uh, we, we, with those uh, contours, you overlay those on a land use map. Right? And then uh, you would begin to determine whether or not there are land uses, uh, incompatible land uses within those uh, within that 65 CNEL noise exposure contour. Um, in many cases, I've heard, or 
two local cases come to mind. So this is Burbank and also LAX. Uh, they went through this process. So if you go, uh, you know, in the areas uh, east and west of LAX, you can see that a lot of houses have been removed. Um, and that is through the Part 150 process. So that is a that was a noise mitigation effort. Um, you know, houses were purchased and demolished and removed from the uh, the 65 CNEL noise exposure contour. Um, in contrast, Burbank, um, you know, had has undertaken multiple Part 150 studies. Actually, has one going on right now. Um, and and their uh, mitigation uh, method of choice has been the sound insulation. So they've had a comprehensive sound insulation program. Um, Corey? Yep. I think I can, you know, simplify this answer just a little bit, and then maybe if there's a little bit more. Uh, so the Part 150 study noise exposure maps for the FA criteria do not identify, uh, well, there's a limited exception uh, for Oxnard Airport. For Camarillo Airport, there are no residences that fall within the FA's criteria as having a noise problem. So the airport is actually using, the Part 150 study is very valuable for us because it confirms with the FAA whether we're going to be uh, in line to be able to receive any federal funding, whether we'll be eligible, uh, and you have to fall within the FAA's criteria. The second part of this study, though, however, is where we look at alternatives that Perhaps, and this is where we address the noise that the FAA is saying is not a problem. Because we acknowledge that there's noise and that there are, uh, and this process allows us to explore are there ways that we can mitigate this noise, that we can uh, bring some relief to our community members. So the Part 150, uh, from an FAA standpoint, helps, uh, helps us use it as a tool to get there. And, and again, just to clarify what Aaron said, um, if in the eyes of the FAA that we don't have a noise issue by their standards, only means they won't help us fund, as Corey talked about, remediation of buying homes or doing other things. But as you've heard us say, we are committed to doing, spending our dollars to help mitigate these issues. Okay, thank you. Next question. We'll go Rachel, and then we'll go to Elsa. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi. Um, I lived on Elm Street in Old Town across from the school for about two years. I wouldn't be able to do my college uh, class, like over video, in the backyard in the afternoon. Literally, the jets were that loud. Like, I would have to go inside to talk to anybody on the phone. They couldn't hear me. Then I moved to Grandview, and it's actually a little bit better. It doesn't like rattle windows or anything, but just kind of a personal question. Do any of you guys live in Camarillo? I do not. I do not. No, I do not. By coincidence. We, we work there. But, no, uh, yeah. but I have family in Camarillo. I partially grew up in Camarillo off of uh, Upland with a lot of the military traffic. Thank you. Okay, next question. You could say your name. Uh, my name is Kyle Johnson, also in Old Town. Um, I think uh, maybe uh, Renee's question was a little bit misinterpreted. I think she's pointing out that the table uh, with the for the noise monitoring is maybe presented a little confusingly, and it's confusing people, right? Like using the SEL, right? Like it's solicited, like she's saying, it's listed with decibels. It makes you think that's what is being recorded and you're hearing, right? I thought that, right? Um, and I've also commented on this table when it was first presented that you still are leaving all of the non-aircraft events in there. Many of the LMAX events, you asterisk as that was not an aircraft. It was a dog barking or a motorcycle. Like, I get life is loud, okay. But, like, boil it down for us. Give us the data, you know, of like, that. this is what you actually recorded in one week. Here we're, like, all we have is your word of saying, yeah, that one event, one 90 decibel plus event of actual LMAX data 
was, I think it was like the MiG, right? Like that old, you know, uh, military jet, right? But like, why is it not presented in there? Um, so I, I would encourage an update to that table where you, you show us that data. Um, I, so I don't really need a response for that. Um, I so, would also, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, um, so I believe we have updated the, the table in response to your comment. So there may be an updated version, but I'm happy to continue that specific conversation because uh, you know we're, we're not denying um, the the you know the no, noise levels that were uh, recorded. Um, but earlier I was trying to put it into context with uh, with relation to the JPA text. So it's the, which is a separate um, way to look at noise. You know more rather than looking at a you know an event level. Um, a measured event level, it's a single event type of contour, which is a separate, you know, in, in line with the, the use of uh, cumulative contours. Uh, and I process. appreciate that explanation. It was really helpful to hear, right? But I, you know, my point is, like, you just need a table that's digestible, too, right? Um, and then I did want to add about the, the garage comment, right? Like, you know, you don't want your garage five miles away. The people that are landing to Camarillo are coming to Camarillo. Like, and we've all looked on this, but I just pulled up Cloud9's website in here, right? They show a map of distances to places in LA, right? They're trying to draw people in from LA. They say, like, escape the hustle and bustle of LA, right? This is, you know, a main operator at your airport, right? Like, so I, I don't like comments like that. It seems misleading from you know, how the airport is actually acting, right? Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Okay, any other questions? A few more. Hi, Sheila Riley, um, Cam Heights. I have a lot of empathy for the people who live in Old Town. I can't imagine living under those circumstances. We live in Cam Heights, and our beautiful, peaceful place where I used to do gardening all the time, has become a nightmare. Every four minutes, there are one of those prop planes over our yard, and it's gotten to where we can't sit outside during the day because we can't hear one another. We're older. We cannot hear one another. So I can't imagine what it's like with a jet flying. And I, I, I'm glad that woman asked the question, how many of you live in Camarillo? Because two of you raised your hand that you would live in Old Town. I doubt you would, seriously. And I'm concerned also about our property values. I came from Pasadena, and I moved, there, I moved from there to this place because it got too crowded. And when you live in a place where there's so much noise, you can't enjoy the beauty of sitting outside on a California day. Nobody wants to buy that house. We're not going to be able to sell our homes for the prices we expect to get because of this airport-ish situation. That's my, co that's my comment. Thank you, Sheila. Hi. Thank you. Um, so I'm coming here as a community member. Ma'am, sorry, if you could address all your questions to the panel. Thank okay. you. Okay. As a community member, as somebody who owns property here in Ventura County, somebody who was born in Ventura County, raised in Ventura County, and has worked every single day, single day of my life in Ventura County since I was 15. And I'm going to stand up here, and I am proud to say that I am the vice president of a company called AVEX Aviation. And AVEX Aviation is a small business that has been based at Camarillo Airport for the last 39 years. This is a business who employs other community members like me 50 of us, who many of have worked here for over 20 years. They are people who are remarkable community members, many of whom are veterans who have served overseas, come back home, and they do amazing, remarkable work. They work on planes that are eco-friendly, they're fuel efficient, and they are planes that other people could afford to own much louder bigger, environmentally worse aircraft, and they elect, because of the type of mindset they are, to own these type of planes, and we're proud to maintain them here 
in your backyard where I live and where these other people who work here in the community live who are veterans, who are absolutely remarkable people who would give you the shirt off their back. And so, ma'am, you know, if you could address the panel, thank you. So what I'm asking of my fellow community members is when you're inconvenienced by an aircraft flying over and it impacts you in an adverse way, ask yourself if it's worth the detriment of these people losing their jobs, not feeding their families. I see, sir, I see you laughing. Ma'am, um, if, ma'am, if you could address the panel, you have to maintain the code of conduct, please. Thank you. Okay, so these people that, that work at our... And you have about 30 seconds left. These people that work at our company, the type of customers that we have, the people who operate these airplanes, they're kind, compassionate people that use their planes to transport medical victims and do it at no cost to those people. They use it in angel flight. They, they do things and give back to the community. And, sir, I see that you're very uns unsympathetic. Ma'am, please don't address the, the audience. Thank you. But I'm happy to field each and every one of your questions afterwards because I am proud to be associated with this business and with the people that work there. So please, I'm, I'm here Thank after you. the meeting, and I'm, I'm here to field your questions. Thank you for your comment. All right. Anybody else? Sir, if you could stand up and please say your name. Hi. I'm William Pratt. I live in Newberry Park. We have impacts up there, too. We're on the approach pattern. Um, as a, uh, I'm a uh, county official, and I'm wondering who approves when you guys, assuming the ALP goes through and you apply for these different grant opportunities, does the county supervisors accept that funding, or do you have an independent board? So we start, our process starts with our Aviation Advisory Commission and our airport authorities. We have one for Camarillo and for Oxnard. It goes through them, and then ultimately it's to the Board of Supervisors. As mentioned, however, <laughs> you start with convincing the FAA that it's needed. Yeah, no, I get that. If you don't have the ALP, nothing else happens. Yeah. So well, it's, really, ultimately, the political pressure is with the Board of Supervisors. So if you wanted to kill the airport, you wouldn't accept the funding. The, air, the airport wouldn't be maintained. We'd be decertified, and they have to do something else with it. That's way down the line. So I don't think you ought to worry about that quite so, quite yet. Yeah, as, as pointed out, again, we had some obligations when we took the facility. So there's that, and then each time we take a grant, it starts a 20-year clock uh, for maintaining the airport in a safe, efficient manner. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, William. Any other questions? Raise your hand. Okay. Yes, ma'am. If you could say your name. Hi. My name's Jackie Babanko, eight-year Camarillo resident. I live village at the park. I also work at Camarillo Airport. Um, I want to take a moment and thank everybody on the panel for being here, being patient, and in fielding all of these questions. I understand the scope of this meeting was about the airport layout plan, and not to diminish anybody's concerns, but thank you for answering all the noise complaint concerns, even though that wasn't the scope of this meeting. To pivot, to pivot back to the airport layout plan, I know that those are all potential projects, but are there any that are priority in respect to the others in terms of getting those done? So we would talk about our primary pavements, which really is runway out, and that's where we focus our priorities. So based on conditions of the pavement and the and the um, subgrade we prioritize our pavement rehabilitation in that manner runway out thank you thank you Aaron any other questions over here hi hi if you could say your name okay I'm Brenna and um, I live in the community I work here um, I'm also a student pilot so um, I, just to know that we fly in certain patterns at certain altitudes and we're never trying to go directly over anybody's house or anything. So if there are ways for us to better with the noise in the housing, um, I'm all up for it. Um, but there is like a certain altitude we have to fly and the runway has to be a certain direction because of the wind. So we're like, we're trying our very best. Um, and I know there are certain houses we try not to fly over ever, so... And I do all my maneuvers out at the ocean, so 
Um, I just want to know, I, I live here too, and I don't know if I'm in a direct flight path, but there's planes coming over my house all the time too, so I get it. Um, and I just want to let you guys know, like, I'm a student because I want to be able to help people and do the angel flights and um, help people get to medical care that they need. So I appreciate it, and I appreciate hearing from everybody as well. So we're on board to help you guys with the noise too. Um, so, yeah, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Brenna. Sir, if you'd stand up and say your name. Oh, yeah, good afternoon. I'm Nick Martino. Um, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. I'm a 10-year mm, resident of Ventura County. I'm sorry, uh, Camarillo, and probably uh, my whole life Ventura County. But I also wanted to uh, let all of you know and the board that, uh, um, you know, I'm one of the owners of Cloud9 and Channel Islands, as some of you might know. And uh, one of the things that uh, some of you might know also is that I used to work for the County of Ventura, the Department of Airports, and there is an extraordinary amount of effort going into the public outreach um, elements of the ALP and the Part 150 study. I know I will I speak on behalf of uh, a couple businesses, and I know for sure I've been in a lot of the meetings where the airport has reached out to us directly and asked uh, for our input and asked for uh, ways that we can do better and I think that's a direct result of the community and um, all of you speaking up. And so I do want to kind of reinforce that um, they are hearing you. And in turn, they're calling and they're talking to us and they're asking us to educate our pilots. And they're, you know, we have um, probably about 20 um, uh, flight instructors. We have uh, Channel Islands employees, about 40 staff members. Uh, uh, 90 something percent, we did a head count, uh, if you don't mind. But uh, we did a head count, about 90% of them live in Camarillo, actually, uh, rent or, or, or own homes. And so they choose to buy their homes in the community and rent the apartments or town or wherever in the community because of its proximity to Camarillo Airport. I know that I'm one of those those people. And so um, to kind of echo uh, Daniel's passion, uh, you know, it's really important that we take uh, both sides into account and that uh, I, I want to continue to um, offer our support. And I know that there was a gentleman's comment about uh, you know, Cloud9 wanting to reach out to uh, businesses outside of the community, and and yeah, I, that's absolutely true, and that's very. So we want to support all the local businesses, and I and my personal opinion is is that Camarillo Ventura County is a beautiful place to live and do business, and if we can help bring these businesses into the county in a res in a responsible way, then uh, and give them a place to do business and raise their kids and go to school and and you know take part in other businesses, then we should be doing everything we can on a responsible level. And I know that, you know, when we went through the Cloud9 approval process, it was very public. Uh, many of you contributed in a lot of ways. And uh, the, you know, the environmental process took more than a year. I know uh, Aaron was a big part of that, and Dave for many of the, much of that too. And, um, and so, um, you know, it was, and, and we talked about noise contours and types of aircraft and types of equipment that would construct Cloud9 and all of the things that go into that. And so uh, I just want to make sure that uh, you know, if there's, there's anything that we can do as businesses um, that we continue to um, reach out. And I uh, hope I'm not putting too big of a target on my back here, but, but I do think it's important. That's it. Thank you, Nick. Any other questions? Ma'am? If you'll stand up and say your name. Hi, my name is Susan Ying, and I really appreciate this meeting. This is the very first one I've come to. Uh, I'm not a resident here, but I own a hangar over in Camarillo, and also my company owns, uh, well, they rent two hangars over there, and I want to share, you know, Dave talk about the good side, uh, all the good things that the airport's doing, and I want to share some of that, and uh, also the future, uh, maybe not the future in the next few months, but the future in the next couple of years. Um, also, Keith talked about the electric airplanes, and my company makes electric airplanes. And they're coming out, uh, they're gonna be- Ma'am, so if you could address the panel. Thank yes, you. sure. Thank you. And so I think the challenge is noise. We've been hearing from everybody about noise. So the future is going to be a lot less noise. And, um, and so I just wanted to share this with everybody and also with the airport. In order to uh, do that, we need to have the infrastructure to support that. And you know, hence, I think I'm very encouraged by uh, the other question regarding the airport is, 
working on building the infrastructure for the charging and everything. Because after all, without the clean energy into the electric airplanes or electric cars on the road, then you know we're not really doing sustainable things. And so just very encouraging things. And also Camarillo is the only airport because I flew out of Orange County Airport, Long Beach Airport, Hawthorne Airport, finally moved out here. I think this is one of the best airports and doing some of the most innovative things because you're out of the Class B airspace. And also you have AVEC and you have all these other companies that are supporting the whole development of general aviation. In general, aviation is something that you know is very unique in the United States, not in Europe, not in Asia, and so you know it, it, we really ought to cherish this. It's it's really amazing here. Thank you, Susan. Okay, any other questions? This side, good. Okay, oh, yes, ma'am. I just say your name. Lauren De La Torre, and I'm a 35-year um, resident in Old Town. And I, I can appreciate everyone that has connections with the airport, that you're concerned. It sounds like everybody's very concerned. That's not what we want. We just want to be able to sit in our backyards, be able to not have a big jet fly over every few minutes. We want to make sure that we don't have noise pollution, chemical pollution, and it's visual pollution. When you have that big jet flying over your house, it just kind of throws everything off. So no offense to anybody that is concerned about their airport business, that's not what we're concerned about. We're concerned about our lives, our quality of life, and we want to make sure that we get to have it as nice a place where some of you live, some of you live in Camarillo. We want to keep that. We don't want to sell our homes. We don't want to be Van Nuys. Please help us, because you're being great listeners right now. Appreciate that, but it had nothing, nothing to do with any of these other businesses. We're not going out with banners saying, close down the airport. That's not what we want. We want to have our quality of life back. I've lived there for 35 years. The last four years have been horrible. Before that, it was delightful. So thank you for giving me that opportunity to speak. It was not a question, but it was a comment. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one in the back there. And then I think that's the last one. Ma'am, if you'll say your name. Yeah, right here. Right. Hi, my name is Renee. I've been in the camera for 63 years. Oh, louder, louder. Oh. My name is Renee, and I've lived in Camarillo for 63 years. And I still love it, but that's not the point. My question is about the runway layout, which I think this meeting was about, and the runway width. So you're going to decrease it from 150 to 100. Is my first question, and I understand that is for airport or for to make it standardized. And I think that is making it less safe for the pilots. I think the greater width is actually safer. And also, where is the run-up area? Hi, Renee. Uh, Hi. So first, first regarding the, the 150 feet versus the 100 feet, um, the, the FAA standard, so they, they get to tell us what standards we meet um, when they give us all the money. So if, they, if we need $40 million to rebuild a runway, they get to tell us the width and the cross slopes and all of that stuff. So we, we obey. Uh, and, and they say we can increase width beyond that, but that's on our dime. Uh, and so I, I agree that a narrower runway okay. might look less safe, but uh, for the for the largest of the GA jets that we expect to see, uh, and, that, and that we would be forecasting to to receive, 100 feet is the is the specified width of that, and so because we're committed to the JPA and the 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 various dimensions of that, um, we say absolutely let's let's build it the way FAA would would say is safe for that group of airplanes, uh, and no more than that. So that's, uh, that's, that's our posture for, for that piece of it. And you had another question? Well, uh, where is the run-up area going to be? Uh, there's going to be no change to the location of the... You, 
reached for that really quickly. Um, yeah, the, the, the runoff areas are going to be the same place. There's a little bit of reconfiguring uh, within the footprint there, but yeah, at, at Alpha 1, well, it's going to be Alpha 1, but at Alpha and Echo, those, uh, for, for the folks in the room, that's both ends of the runway where the a, a little place where you can dwell and do final run-up checks of your airplane before departing. Uh, so, same places. And the exits are going to be perpendicular to the runway, which is going to slow down traffic. Uh, that'll be that'll be examined in final design. But yeah, what we're depicting is what is typical for an airport of our type, and so we're showing that as a default case. Uh, but we may be able to make some tweaks to that, um, especially from user input. So we'll be listening for that as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Renee. Okay, well with that, um, looks like Nick, you might have one more question. And then Nick will be our last question. Sorry, uh, in regards to the runway uh, conversation, since we're on it real quick, um, I heard some of the panel members say earlier that uh, that uh, in regards to the noise uh, and the FAA noise studies, that you know the FAA might say this is where we draw the line, but that didn't mean that the county wasn't prepared to to you know spend their own money to go above and beyond in you know working with the community. So likewise, when we talk about the runway, um, I think uh, Dave just mentioned that. You know, the FAA says that, hey, 100 feet is totally sufficient for, for our critical aircraft design, but it might not be the safest. And so would the county be prepared to, you know, do the same for the runway and say, hey, we'll put up our own dollars to ensure that the runway actually doesn't decrease in width? Um, and, you know, would you be willing to listen to the airport users, um, you know, if they said, hey, that's not our preference? Um, yeah, as we go through those designs. Yeah, let me, I'll answer that quickly is, the answer is yes, we would look at our own funds, but I want to stress, to use the word it's not safe, again, there is unbelievable analysis by the FAA in what is safe, and so that is the standard for, again, the size of airplanes that are used in our airport. But, uh, on the other side is, if there is something that makes sense for us, for our users, then we would look at that. Okay, one more, and then if there's any outstanding questions, our project team will be hanging out for a few minutes so you can you can find somebody on the panel. Go ahead, sir. What's your name? My name's John Greenwood. I wanted to get back to the forecast section of the uh, ALP and, and the uh, and the noise study as well. One thing I'm not still clear on is in a table that's used in both the noise study and the ALP, it forecast an increase of turbine engine. Um, planes, aircraft, both uh, uh, jet and turboprop, uh, from about the 12,000 a year that are, go that are coming in going, 12,000 operations a year that are coming in going now, in 20 years up to about 49,000 a year. And I've heard that's just a forecast, I've heard that it's, I, and I'm not clear on how real those numbers are, if that is going to happen to our community, if it's forecast to happen, if it's a guess. What do those numbers mean? If you need to look it up or if you've got that in front of you, it's table 2N and it is referenced in both the ALP and the, uh, and the noise study. What, what do those numbers really mean to this community? Well, I'll just take a shot on the technical side of it. So the 12,000 number that you're referencing was jet engine operations in 2022. When you add the turboprops to that, it's about 17,000. And I'm looking, at right, I'm looking at it right here. Um, and then in the 20 year forecast. Okay, yeah. and then the long term forecast for the combined total of jets and turboprops was about 50, so about 17,000 to about 50,000. So that, that is the forecast. So the, the analysis behind that is what we were talking about up here before, and that is the, the trends that are that we're seeing occurring, uh, mostly here locally, but also nationally. Uh, fewer operations by single and multi-engine piston planes, more operations by the turbine power. So that, those are numbers this very 
I would never say that because it is a forecast. Um, you know, one of the examples we pointed to in the slideshow before was that 99 forecast that was going up to 315,000 operations, and that never happened. And things might or might not happen here, but we think it is a reasonable estimate to be planning around. Um, but we should always be vigilant on what is actually happening year to year. In fact, the FAA recommends that airports update these forecasts about every five to seven years. So even though it's a 10-year study and a 20-year master plan, they still want to see those forecasts addressed to address changes in the industry. So, uh, the 2011 forecast is like spot on, too. Well, it was below. I mean, the actuals were below, but we're, we're speaking about we're speaking one at a time. Um, so, I just wanted to make one other point about the forecast, and and it's that because we were doing a noise study at the same time, and because the noise model runs on the forecasts, we wanted to make sure we weren't understating it. So we wanted to say we're going to run contours, we're going to put those into the model, the model's going to do its business and calculate where those noise contours are. We are certainly not going to want to understate what we might hope to, or not hope, what we might actually experience over the long term. So we were, we were okay with the fact that it was showing a high number because then that, that allowed us to have uh, the, the noise contours as big as we think they would ever get. So that was part of the reason why we were comfortable with a high side forecast. Um, but we may not see that activity. Um, it could be different either way. So I don't know any more than I knew before. Okay, so they may, we may or may not reach that level. We did. It's just, there's no other input I can get from the Kaufman guys that did the study that give me some reliability to that, nothing at all. Well, I mean, I think we've explained, we look at the national forecasts, we look at the regional forecasts, we look at what the FAA is projecting in their aerospace forecast from a fleet mix perspective, from hours, operations flown, things like that. So that's, that's what goes into these. That's what the FAA wants to look at when they want to be able to approve a reasonable forecast, which they did as a part of this process. So we have to follow FAA methodologies to make sure we're coming up with that, and that's what we did as a part of these forecasts. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for your comments, panel. If there are any other outstanding questions, panel will be hanging out for a few minutes. Thank you all for coming. Information's on the website. Thanks, everybody.